I call to order the virtual study session of the Lakewood City Council on Monday, April 15th at 7.02 p.m. To connect with the council meeting this evening, please use one of the following links, lakewoodspeaks.org or lakewood.org slash council videos. And for public comments, uh, we will be keeping Lakewood Speaks open to receive public comments, not only through the meeting tonight, but into the morning hours tomorrow. It'll be open until 10 a.m. So for any of our observers tonight, um, please feel free to send any of your comments, thoughts, questions you, our way through Lakewood Speaks, and your councils will have the ability to view those. Um, we are also, uh, well, we'll be talking about two topics tonight. First, we'll be getting an update on cold weather sheltering, and then secondly, moving over to a topic regarding parkland dedication and um, improvement fees. So with that, I will hand it over to the clerk. Will you, the clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Strom? Here. Cruz? Here. Labier? <laughs> Hello? Here. May I, may, I, may I Guerrero? Here. Nystrom? Here. Over? Here. Ryan? Yes. Farazai? Here. Sinks? Here. Stewart? Here. Mayor Strom, you have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. Um, so with that, we'll introduce our first topic this evening is a presentation on the cold weather shelter update and an opportunity for city staff to come back to report back to city council. This was our first full cold weather season that we um, had options for unhoused through um, largely recovery works through the um, cold weather snaps that we saw throughout the winter. So asking staff to come report back to give us um, what was seen out there. It's very much a learning experience, this is very much a progress, our uh, work in progress. So we're excited to hear um, from a number of uh, presenters this evening. Uh, what I'll do is I'll hand over the microphone to our deputy city manager, Ben Goldstein, to get us started um, with the presentation tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. I'm going to share my screen so we can jump right in. And uh, it's a fairly short presentation uh, with a focus on the background and then addressing the key questions, the three questions that Council asked, and then a bit of a summary about our operation. But uh, we really want tonight to be a dialogue with you all uh, to answer the questions you have. Um, as the Mayor said, uh, a lot has happened over the last year. It's been a learning experience for us. Um, for us all. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, we have myself, we also have uh, James Ginsburg from Recovery Works available to answer questions. And then Sergeant Alan Alden uh, from the CAT team and uh, Matt or Matthew Wellington, uh, who's one of our homeless navigators. So uh, tonight's presentation will be uh, focused on the cold weather shelter. We will have an opportunity for a broader discussion in in the future about homelessness and some of the other efforts uh, regarding the continuum of housing. Uh, but tonight's presentation is really kind of a, a season summary of the cold weather shelter. I'll share my screen now. All right, can you all see that? Okay. So I wanted to start off tonight uh, with a little bit of background. Um, some of you are new to council and uh, the beginning of our cold weather shelter uh, predates your time on council. So hopefully this will be informative to you. And for those of you who were on council um, when we embarked on this journey, um, maybe a bit of a, a retros retrospective experience. So uh, historically, the city of Lakewood has not provided sheltering services to those who are unhoused in a congregate setting. As the needs grew in Lakewood in recent years, however, the city continued to look for innovative solutions to support those in need. 
This began with the creation of the police department's CAT team, the community action team, whose specially trained agents work with many residents experiencing homelessness. In 2020, the city of Lakewood continued its leadership in uh, leadership and innovation when it began the first uh, when it was one of the first municipalities in the region to deploy homeless navigators with the CAT team. In an effort to go further than just crime prevention and truly work toward finding uh, stable housing for those experiencing homelessness. To date, the homeless navigators have successfully assisted 133 people into long-term housing and prevented 77 evictions. I think it's important uh, to key in on that because though we are doing uh, a lot of great work through the cold weather shelter, we continue to do all this other work and it builds on itself. Uh, and, and the CAT team is still playing an active role in this. Uh, the city's first overnight shelter was activated on February 22nd of 23 at the Whitlock Recreation Center. These first shelter nights pushed the organization to its limit as emergency declarations were speedily crafted to allow for the use of the facility, uh, uh, use of a facility that was not purpose built to house a congregant setting. It was an all hands on deck effort. Um, and some of you will remember that it was a little bit of a scramble to get up and running, um, but uh, it was successful. And we were able to house 41 individuals during those first two nights at the Whitlock Recreation Center. The use of the Whitlock Recreation Center for the city's first overnight extreme weather shelter resulted in operational disruptions for the rec center, for the rec center's regular users. Thus, a new location was needed to identify as the city looked toward additional nights of sheltering in the future. Many city owned facilities were evaluated, but those facilities had similar drawbacks as the use of the Whit Whitlock Recreation Center. Recovery Works, an existing community partner that was already working to help those experiencing homelessness in our community, was looking to expand its services and was willing to allow the city to operate its extreme weather overnight shelter out of its newly leased space at 8000 West Colfax, which remains the current location for the city shelter. This space would require the use, continued use of an emergency declaration because it too was not designed to house a congregate setting, but the location on Colfax was truly ideal for this facility. <clears throat> The City of Lakewood and City Council should be proud of all that has been accomplished during the last year and particularly what was achieved in the mid-January cold snap that we had earlier this year. Sheltering those without housing is a new service that has not previously been provided for the city and remains a work in progress as I think many of you understand. The city is still in a transition as it works towards a fully operational navigation center with a with a built in overnight shelter. That said, Lakewood is truly leading the way among its peers in Jefferson County and should be looked at differently than cities such as Denver, for it is not a city and county and has historically not provided human services. So now transitioning a little bit to uh, where we are and the the three questions that were highlighted. On October 8th of 24, City Council approved the request by two council members to hold a study session. Uh, this was attempted earlier this year, um, but had to be delayed for a variety of reasons. Uh, we're doing it now. We would have done an end of season wrap up, so we apologize that we couldn't do it earlier, but um, this is that study session and an indices bin wrap up. Uh, the three questions are on the screen. The first question, how does Lakewood's extreme weather shelter get activated? Lakewood uses a temperature threshold of 20 degrees for activation. Precipitation is not a criteria for Lakewood shelter activation as it is difficult to predict 
well in advance and Lakewood needs to provide its community partners 48 hours notice. Um, we've looked at uh, changing this criteria, but we think it would be difficult. Uh, as you know, we did activate the shelter when we had the uh, extreme snow event or, or heavy snow event earlier this year that required an additional emergency declaration to activate the emergency declaration that we use to activate at the recovery work site at 8000 West Colfax does specify 20 degrees as the threshold for activation. When the shelter was first initiated, uh, when we ran those two nights in 23, we used a temperature threshold of 32 degrees that temperature threshold seemed to be kind of the norm across the region. Um, some cities use a temperature threshold of zero degrees, so 20 degrees colder than Lakewood's new threshold for activation. So we feel like the 20 degree threshold is a, uh, a, a good threshold, um, but it has resulted in additional nights of operation and a bit of a pivot for city staff. How does the city communicate uh, with the public when the cold weather, sh weather shelter is activated? I think um, when this question was initially asked, uh, there, there were a lot of growing pains going on for the city um, as far as communications. I think in general, we are doing a much better job uh, in communicating about shelter activation uh, now than, than we had been doing previously. Um, the city launched a new website, and you're seeing a screenshot of that on the slide here. Uh, the website serves as a one-stop shop for those seeking information uh, related to unhoused individuals or who are currently unhoused. Um, it has a ton of resources, including a direct link to Heading Home uh, and the 211 system. Also, it has information about the Severe Weather Shelter Network, who has been a partner of the city's and also activates a uh, cold weather shelter with slightly different criteria than the city shelter, but does, um, I think, now operate as a tandem. Um, largely, we're operating many of the same nights um, that they are. Uh, in addition to the new website and other outreach mechanisms, city staff uh, went uh, very aggressive on social media. And though we haven't completed our postseason postseason tallies, we think that uh, based on early uh, or mid season numbers, we will probably exceed two hundred thousand impressions on our multiple social media channels, uh, and over twenty thousand uh, engagements. So that is someone liking a post or engaging on that post. So those are big numbers. That's just related to shelter and uh, other homeless services that we've put out on social media. So we are seeing very good traction on social media. I think it's worth noting that this is a population that uh, pushed communication staff in finding new ways to communicate with. It's inherently a difficult population to communicate with um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but we think we're doing a pretty good job now. We haven't um, heard any of the concerns that we were hearing previously um, in in the past several nights of operation. Uh, but again, we, we continue to strive um, to, to be better and, and we'll keep pushing the envelope here. Uh, I wanted to go over some of the numbers um, related to our nights of operation. Um, I think, you know, First of all, looking at the total at the bottom, that's a really impressive number given that Lakewood wasn't in this space at all a couple of years ago. Um, the, the fact that we have set up and now operate an extreme weather shelter, I think is a testament to city council and staff's uh, dedication to the public and all members of our community. It has been a challenge, um, lots of growing pains along the way, but we are getting better at it. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that uh, Lakewood has been deliberate in this process and 
uh, hasn't thrown in caution to the wind. Uh, we remain steadfast to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars, but also um, creating a safe environment for those um, who are seeking shelter with us. We don't want to put anyone in a situation that's unsafe. Um, you'll notice as you look at the numbers around uh, that mid-January event, they got up pretty high. Um, and I think, you know, we we had some lessons learned uh, during that event. There was so much need in the community and we really weren't prepared um, for that kind of need. Like what didn't end up being a, a critical piece in Jefferson County's response. Um, and we were transporting away from our shelter because we really did reach capacity. Um, we were attempting to voucher as many people as we could in advance of those nights, but the numbers got pretty high. Um, after that event, we did work with the fire department and our own building officials to uh, better go through the existing space at 8,000 West Colfax that was being used for sheltering and find a number um, that fits within the uh, confines of the space. So you'll see that uh, beginning with the operational night of February 10th uh, and throughout the rest of the year, it's 50. Uh, that is our capacity for the shelter. Um, that's an agreed upon capacity with the fire department and our building officials. Uh, when we operated the shelter uh, over capacity um, during those nights, and I don't know that we had as firm of a set capacity. We were still figuring out that space. Um, we did cause damage to the facility. Um, it it met its limit. And uh, for those of you who read through the mid-season report, you'll know that uh, we overloaded the plumbing and, and resulted in the closure of Recovery Works daytime operations for two days as well. Um, so yes, we made it through and Recovery Works was in step with us during those operational nights, but um, operating a, a cold weather shelter is not exactly like um, operating a library or something like that. There's a lot of stuff that um, goes down the toilets and it was, it was a little too much for the facility. It was a good learning experience for us also as we're a partner in Recovery Works with Recovery Works in creating a more permanent shelter setting and know that we're going to have to spend some real money to set that facility up for long long term success. So, you know, it's not just put some paint on the walls and, and get it ready uh, for 100 folks. We're, we're really going to have to look at the infrastructure of the facility and, and put it in a position uh, for heavy usage. Uh, you'll also see that we began tracking uh, how many folks we transported and then how many folks we vouchered. Uh, these numbers uh, you'll see for, for the last several nights or last few nights of operation um, were unknown. That, that's part of another learning curve we've had. Uh, we work with Bayod to operate our shelter and they're working through uh, tracking these different numbers as well. And we hope to get these numbers at some point, but they weren't able to uh, firm them up. We also have lots of different folks vouchering. So uh, because the county hasn't been able to come through with its own shelter um, as a peer shelter to Lakewood, their solution has been vouchering. And, and they've, they've put county resources up, uh, financial resources to help with those voucher nights. Um, they've also approved Bayod to uh, assigned vouchers. So that was a big step for us because previously vouchers had to be assigned by a cat agent or police agent. And now our new system with Bayod, we were we were filling up and then vouchering, but we didn't want people to wait till late in the night when it might be really cold and dangerous because they wanted to get a hotel room. Um, we didn't want to provide an incentive to stay out in the cold longer to try and be the 51st person. So working with Bayod and working with our police agents and CAT, uh, we identified a plan where it's essentially 
we voucher as much as we can in the beginning, anticipating that we'll reach capacity. And because we've met capacity every single night since we've had the, the 50 in, in place. Um, so we'll start vouchering in the beginning or when we reach capacity, we will uh, let the first ones in. So Bayard keeps track of who came in and kind of what their order was to the shelter. So people are starting to queue up to get ready to come in at seven o'clock when the shelter opens. Uh, so that first person in the shelter, once they reach capacity, will then get vouchered out or have the option to be vouchered out to a hotel. Sometimes they choose not to go because they've already gotten settled for the night. They've already had their meal. You know, we might not reach capacity till 11 or one in the morning. Well, they're asleep. They don't want to go. You know, they just want to stay asleep. So, you know, we do want to offer it to them, though, as the first one to the shelter. So that's another area where we've we've continued to evolve uh, as we've moved forward. I think ideally going forward, Lakewood needs to not be the only city offering shelter. Uh, we really do need our other peers in Jefferson County to step up and, and offer sheltering. Um, and I think, you know, for those of you who are kind of trying to think about how can we help as a city council? That's a key part is working with other cities to get their city councils to make the tough decisions that you all made and step up and start offering sheltering through the creation of another navigation site. It was never envisioned that Lake would be would be the sole provider of navigation services. Um, so we really need to see that so that Lakewood doesn't become a magnet for those in need. We want to serve our community and we want to serve those in Jefferson County, but we can't be the only game in town. Um, happy to answer more questions um, as I see some of you uh, were, were definitely deep in thought during that portion. Um, the the final question of the three questions that were asked uh, by city council or approved by city council, uh, what are the plans for the future? Um, as as many of you know, uh, the city accepted a, a significant grant from Recovery Works, uh, or, sorry, from DOLA uh, to work with Recovery Works to help build out this space in a permanent setting. Ultimately, we anticipate about 100 beds and uh, again, a significant overhaul to the space at 8,000 West Colfax. Uh, we are looking at a continuum of housing needs, um, but won't be getting into all of that tonight. Um, so I really just want to focus tonight's discussion on the cold weather shelter portion. And with that, I will move into questions and stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. And you did an eloquent job of, of communicating what felt like a very uncomfortable, constantly moving, constantly trying to get it right situation uh, while we've gone so far. And thank you so much. And, and I should mention, too, for our public attendees that are joining us tonight or watching this after tonight, there are uh, a couple of things of information that will give you more more information about this a staff memo as well as the mid-year report doesn't go up as late as march but gives you some really good background um, outside of this conversation so if you're looking to learn more those are resources available on lakewoodspeaks.org um, we'll go ahead and open up counselor questions with um, counselor mayot guerrero and then counselor speaks Pardon me, the spring, the spring in the air is getting my lungs today. Um, thank you very much. I'm I'm really thrilled that we're able to have like this level of discussion this year about this rather than I mean, right, like I just you talked about it, but I have questions and I and I promise that I'm not actually gonna talk for like 25 minutes, although I want to on this topic, as you all know. <laughs> and and Mr. Goldstein yourself and uh, a few other key staff people, um and have have I've gotten the really the honor of being able to like be a, some level of helping to figure out some of this with you all. And I just want to 
really recognizing you did talk about it, but like on Christmas Eve in 2022, like I was at three in the morning at an emergency shelter that was like, we as Lakewood helped them get caught at the at the Lakewood United Methodist led by Pastor um, Davis Hensley. And, you know, the, the the time periods that they were short on was at three in the morning and I'm a night owl. That's why I see council meetings are all right for me. And, you know, that that was how we did that. Like we were finding bed, we were finding beds, staff were helping to find beds and blankets and figure out people to cook meals as we were also wandering the neighborhoods, driving the neighborhoods and bringing people to a church without like proper resources, but just knowing that we couldn't keep letting people be so injured on the streets, right? And again, that wasn't just me. Like I I got to show up, but I was a part of dozens of community members, at least dozens of staff members who were using their Christmas holiday to try to prevent people from freezing because we didn't have any of this, not a single, like, we didn't even really have great communication with, like, other cities, all of our different departments, right? Like, we can't even figure out that level of how to administer a program like this. And so I do, I, you know, I'm, I think I'm always very willing to recognize the amount of work we have left to do. Um, I'm really ambitious about, I'm really, like, optimistic about what I think that we are capable of, given what we've done. But I just, I have like have to take this moment to feel like proud of the community and proud of the city for seeing a seemingly insurmountable problem that was just not being solved by anyone else and deciding that we had to start figuring it out. And that's just amazing. The amount of compassion, leadership, the amount of learning, perseverance, and and from staff and community. We now operate in Lakewood with a totally different level of political will as a community, not just as like city government. And that's amazing also. So I just, I want to just really say thank you to anyone in the audience that helped with that, everyone on council, then now like everyone on staff who's touched it, which is hundreds of people who have had to touch this program. And um, I just, I'm just so impressed. And the fact that you're like, yeah, this is, we're just doing this report. I promise we're still doing additional work was how you started this conversation because we all want to figure out how to not let people die from weather, right? Um, and that's such a cool shared value because it's actually just not that radical, but it was five years ago. That was a radical idea, right? And so I just, I really wanna take that moment and say thank you so much for your leadership. Um, So sorry for my my monologue. I just, I'm, this is the thing I ran on and I'm, I'm excited we have more steps to do and I'm excited we've taken any steps. It can feel hard. So um, well, I, my questions, um, some of it was on those numbers. You know, I'm really, I am really pleased for the level of, of just trying to figure out that, that hard decision making of keeping people off the streets and not wanting to turn people away and keeping people safe inside, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you, if we know if we ever turned anyone away without having a place for them to go or without having a voucher or an additional shelter or bed to take them to. Um, and if we've given any thought, like if, and if that's the case where we expect that might be the case in the future, if we've given any thought to like how to uh, solve that. Uh, it, we've certainly given lots of thought on how to solve it. And uh, I think we knew when we went to the 50 cap, uh, we were gonna hit that capacity probably every night um, based mm -hmm. on the need we were seeing before, the the new location on Colfax um, being really easy for folks to get to. Um, so uh, I think as far as I know, we haven't had to turn folks away. Um, now that it's possible that, you know, someone, you know, we, we've been at capacity and, you know, someone showed up and saw that we were at capacity and chose not to stay. Um, we have been utilizing vouchers. We've also, and I failed to mention this uh, when I was talking about it earlier, but we now pay uh, Bayod to transport people to motels that we're vouchering. So the city is providing that service. We had asked that maybe the county provide transportation. They didn't or couldn't step into that space. So we're paying Bayad to do that because we saw that as kind of a gap in the system. If we're using vouchers as our overflow, um, county supported vouchers, but 
it's 1130 at night, it's, it's really difficult for someone to get to a hotel or motel that could be a mile and a half away or further. Um, and, and it's cold. Uh, so this city is paying for that. Uh, it has increased our operational costs. Uh, it also provides additional staffing when they're, when, so we require that two people are used for the transport uh, for everyone's safety. And so when those two people aren't transporting to a area motel or hotel, then we have those additional staff members on site. Uh, so that's, that's our current setup. I think it's pretty solid, but uh, it's also not, not the best. Um, we'd really like to have an additional shelter um, in the area that is also serving uh, the those in need. Uh, so I think that's a better system. Vouchering is extremely expensive. Um, and luckily the county's paying for it right now. I don't know that that's a forever thing. So if, you know, we're vouchering 25 a night, that's going to get pretty expensive in a hurry. Um, so I don't know that it's a long-term solution, but it is what we have right now. Uh, we think it will probably be a couple years before we're operational at that 100 person capacity. Um, we're still working on acquisition of 8,000 West Colfax, and then we'll have to do a significant remodel to the space. So it won't be next winter. Um, you know, the winter 24, 25, we will be operating essentially how we are this winter. Um, so, you know, late into this season, we were still making modifications and trying to dial everything in because we know we're going to need those um, ideas moving into next winter. Thank you. I, I, Mayor Strom, I, I defer to you. I know that the, the point of this is a little bit discussion. I have like questions sort of in the similar, additional questions in this like similar category of thing and then was going to pause if that is like the appropriate way to approach that or I can, you know, yield and I, I have like a couple more like numbers questions specifically on like that slide. Since it's on that one, let's go ahead and, and do it. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask my I'll ask my other. I've got another topic. We'll, we can go around. <laughs> um, uh, this <laughs> is uh, yeah. That's that's really interesting to think about. Um, I'm I'm really interested in how we as elected leaders in Lakewood can help like support the effort for that further county and multi city uh, collaboration. So I. I'd just love for us to really discuss how we can support that. Um, one of the other things that sort of came to my mind during that time, um, which you know wasn't a part of this because it's not technically a part of the program, is um, uh, other council people have been in town for more of these than me, so they've done more of this than I have. But I've gotten it at least a couple of times. Uh, get donations from our local restaurants for food to feed people because that's also been a thing, and so. One of the things I was just like reflecting on is the amount, like I was saying, like the amount of like community involvement that also happens and whether or not we've thought about, um, or if we could think about the, uh, like having more consistent outreach with those community leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, volunteers who like just wanna show up. Like if, you know, the way that there's like the ward meeting emails like you just sign up for that list and then you get that alert like the same way that we then get to know the website knows that then providence tavern which has given food multiple times um over the years also not just this year to this uh but to shelters um like they could know and if they have the time and the money and or in the and the spare food that they will let us know or bring it right um just because I know that that's a whole nother space of like staff capacity that's hard, right, to, to navigate that too. So, um, and I, I think food's just a concrete example, but I think there's a lot of ways that the community is is showing up and is interested in continuing to show up to like help support a system that again, we, we actually don't, we barely have the infrastructure to make successful, so. Yeah, um, donations are tough. Uh, it It's a tricky thing from a staff standpoint. Uh, so we pay Bayad to provide meals. Um, you know, we have an operational cost every night that that we fund um, as a as an organization, and uh, we have to do that for consistency. Um, we can't, 
you know, we can't just kind of say, hopefully a restaurant is going to be able to provide food tonight. And um, we, you know, when folks are there, we're going to feed them. Um, so I think, you know, truthfully, from a staff standpoint, it is really challenging um, for those operating the shelter when we do get donations, because it, it kind of throws everything in chaos. Um, so I think if we could set it up in a way where uh, we have a donation website and, you know, they can commit that, you know, they're going to provide and, you know, they, you know, we would know 48 hours in advance that we're going to operate. Um, and, and, you know, they've already signed up and, you know, maybe Bayad can reach out to a handful of restaurants that have kind of volunteered to say, hey, we want to be on the list. Let us know if you're going to operate. So that there are ways we could do it. Um, but I will tell you right now, um, staff would rather not, uh, you know, because it it's very difficult um, and it creates an expectation. So if um, if the patrons are experiencing a really high level of food um, one night and then the next night they're having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because, you know, that's better than nothing, but that's that's what was on the menu. Um, then it can create some hostility or frustrations. Um, so I think, you know, consistency is is kind of better for everyone in this case, but it's definitely something that staff has thought about. Um, you know, I think it's great that the community wants to support. Uh, we, you know, particularly during the January event, we had folks who really wanted to step up. Uh, and they they wanted to provide clothing or or different things like that. But we're running a shelter and it's chaotic. Even even at 50, it's chaotic. Um, it, you know, we're we're trying to create a safe environment. So then if you have a bunch of bags of clothes and stuff like that, you know, we've, we've kind of used that facility to its max, even with 50. And during that really cold weather event, we were over max. Um, so. Uh, I know that's tough for folks to hear that like it kind of creates more chaos um but that's that's the situation i think if we could provide some order to it then maybe that's something we could look at in the future yeah what i'm what i'm hearing is that as somebody who community organizes full time um i am i have you know six months to um be helpful in creating some of that structure that can help people show up in ways that are helpful, right? And that would be communicating with you all, communicating with Recovery Works, and talking to our various volunteers, because I imagine the other skill that we have in the community um, are people who would be also willing to, like, help referee that with Recovery Works, but they would need to be really consistent, right? And so, um, I'm not I'm not committing to that. I'm just saying, like, oh, it sounds like if we could figure out how to, like, fill some of that so it's less expensive, that would be great, but we need to figure out a lot of structure and consistency. Totally heard. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's hard because we're not a volunteer shelter anymore, no. and that's what Lakewood has had before. So people are kind yeah. of used to, to being hands-on. Yeah. This is a professionally run shelter. You know, it it's hundreds of thousands of dollars in contracts, and, you know, there's a lot that goes in to yeah. you know, operating the shelter. And it means that it's safe for people. It, it's really it safe, right. well run, and it's consistent, right? There's right. really bad Train, Trained staff that know yeah. how to work with these population, this population and their needs, and um, mm -hmm. it, just a different thing than we've done in the past. Oh, I wonder if there's like a lot of Lakewood volunteers that want to show up in a church basement in Wheat Ridge somewhere <laughs> while they're still just doing volunteer things. Um, my last question on this particular um a uh, line of reasoning is do we do we keep track of the actual individuals in any way? Like are those the same 50 people, different 50 people, or is that just we're just not dealing with that because we are trying to get people off the streets? I don't know the answer to that question. But so I think we probably have a sense, but we don't we're not someone doesn't need to have a driver's license to come in the door. Um they don't have to they don't have to provide anything. Um we're not um, tracking people for vouchers. It is a little different. We, we do have mm -hmm. some additional paperwork we have to do on the voucher side. Um, but if someone just wants to come sleep in our cold weather shelter, we're happy to let them sleep. Great. 
Thank you so much. Mary, I think you're muted. Oh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sinks, then Sharazai, then Cruz. Thank you. So, yeah, we've been talking about the cold weather shelter. I wonder about the severe weather shelter, which could be warm weather, extremely high temperatures. And so what I wonder is, um, has there been much talk about it? If so, is there a threshold? And it's kind of like inverted with Colorado weather. So the nights in the summer could be very tolerable outside, very livable temperatures, but the but during the day, the afternoons, they could be extremely high. And so um, tell me, talk to me about how you're thinking about the summer, what the idea is there. Yeah, we, we have started to have some conversations uh, about it. Um, you know, we, we had one summer already since, since we activated. We didn't have any uh, days that we needed to provide services. Uh, you're exactly right, though. The, the nights are normally the safer portion of of a, a hot weather event um, or extreme heat event. And then the days, fortunately, we do have recovery works. Um, and, and so that's kind of the solution right now is that recovery workspace. People can get out of the sun. Um, they can find a cool place to be. It, Providing assistance in the heat is a lot easier to do. There's also a lot of other um, kind of third spaces out there in the community, like libraries and stuff like that, um, that are open during the day, um, as opposed to an extreme cold event where the library is cold, closed at night when it's most cold. Um, so, so we haven't seen the need in the community um, during heat events because I think people just have more places to go. Um, We've talked about even doing, uh, setting up misters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so if people don't really want to go inside, they don't want to leave their possessions, you know, they can still kind of get that cooling, um, you know, through mm -hmm. the, the misters and, and stuff like that. Um, and then one just follow up question. If Recovery Works did open their doors during the day in the summer, extremely high temperatures, would there be a capacity limit for them? Do you know? I don't know um, what what their kind of daytime capacity is. Uh, we do have James Ginsburg on the line, um, and I can bring him over, and he might be able to offer, answer that. But we have not had that specific question or discussed that. Uh, let me bring him over now, and Mr. Ginsburg can perhaps speak to if they have a, a operational capacity during the day. Hi, thanks, Ben. James Ginsburg, Executive Director of Recovery Works. Uh, great discussion. I think that the capacity, as I recall, based on bathroom ratios, uh, I think is 200 during the day for non-sleeping. We typically get about uh, between 60 and 90 a day. Great, thanks for your answers. I don't have any others. And it, again, during the day, it might be a bit more transient where someone might come in and then leave as opposed to the night where they're there for that 12 hour period. Mayor Pro Tem Sharizai. Oh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to build on Councillor Sink's question. And just, I wondered about the March storm. It didn't quite hit that temperature threshold, but it was a lot of precipitation. And so did that amend our process? I'm sorry if you miss, if you mentioned that I missed that. But I wanted to understand, like, there's times where it snows a lot, but it's not 20 degrees. So what happens in those situations? And have we formalized that process? So it's not ad hoc every time. Uh, the, so the, the threshold remains 20 degrees without precipit with no regard for precipitation. Uh, when we opened for that March storm, it was a little bit of a scramble. Um, we had not planned on opening because 48 hours out, the, 
the precipitation had huge variance in it, anywhere from like three inches to three feet. It was really high variance, more than a normal storm. We were on calls with the National Weather Service and NOAA trying to get a better understanding of what the storm might look like, but it didn't drop barely below 30 degrees. So it did not trigger our 20 degree threshold. We had to put in place an additional emergency declaration to be able to operate during that. Um, staff is not recommending we use precipitation as one of our criteria because it's so difficult to predict in advance. And, you know, a major storm like that, we might be able to say, we think, you know, it's going to be a foot of snow. We don't know if it's going to be a foot or three feet, but we think we're going to get at least a foot, but not necessarily. And then if it's two inches to six inches, that's even harder to predict. Like, you know, we could end up getting nothing. Uh, today it was going to rain and at least at the city, it hasn't rained yet. So um, precipitation is really difficult. And I know that's hard. Um, part of our challenge is that 48 hours, uh, we have been in conversations with Bayad about amending that 48 hours to a shorter time frame. But right now, they have a lot of staffing demand to manage. So they need to give their employees time to figure out you know, their schedule and, and be able to commit to us. Um, so they haven't been willing to change on the 48 hours as of yet. Um, but I do understand the concern. Sometimes we have significant weather events that are not necessarily a cold weather event. Uh, the reason temperature is also used is it pervade, prevent, uh, it is the greatest risk to human health um, as opposed to just being a snowy night. I would disagree, but okay. So for the sake of this, like I, I hope that's something we could look at uh, because I do think, yes, survivable, but if we, you know, we had city staff like uh, reacting to that pretty quickly. Sorry, you moved around my screen. Uh, you bit. did too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to just make sure that that is something that we're continuing to talk about. And I, I appreciate uh, the context you give, of, you know, it is a scramble. And so, you know, the purpose of policies and procedures is that they're answering the questions so that we don't have to answer it, re-answer it every time. And if I hope that we can continue to reflect on this. And if there continues to be things that we're scrambling to um, figure out, then those are policies that need to be addressed. And I think precipitation would be one that I'd put on the top of the list. Um, this is going to be unpopular, but what's going on with Arvada? There was speculation that they were going to get their navigation center up and running well before we were. And we're sort of dancing around like neighbors doing that, but there was a real commitment from that community. And so, so is there any update that you all can provide on sort of where our partners are in the county? We know everybody has a commitment to this, but I do share your fear of like, well, we'll just um, move folks to Lakewood because they have their systems up and running. And where's the sort of timeline on that second navigation system city center that was gonna come to the county? I don't have any information I can share with you on that. I don't know where our bat is at, unfortunately. Um, I hope they're still moving forward, uh, but I, the last I heard that conversation stalled out a little bit. Um, they were ahead of us. Um, like you said, they, they were gonna be the first navigation center. Um, so hopefully um, things progress and perhaps when we come back and have that broader conversation about kind of that continuum of housing and, and the different things involved in that, maybe some of those uh, more countywide um, discussions will be able to uh, be vetted during that. Great. And just one more question, and this may be one for you, Mr. Ginsburg, but at post renovation, what will be the capacity? We're at 50 now for overnight shelters. I know the daytime services looks different, but what can we expect after the renovation? So we've been in some stages of design with ShopWorks architecture firm that's done, they designed the um, Dolores project and have done other trauma-informed design shelters. 
And, you know, it's kind of a, it's, it, we're going back and forth in terms of, we, we certainly don't want to just do rows and rows of bunks, which would be a high capacity, but it would be a low uh, a, autonomy and, and less trauma informed. And so right now we feel like we're settling in, as Ben said, about a hundred beds. And, and right now we're at 50 female, 50 male with some flex space for, um, gender neutral, um, some flex space for couple, potentially some space for pets. Couples and pets are real challenging shelters, and so we want to try to accommodate that. Um, and even though the typically the demographic on the street is five to one male to female, we don't not necessarily want to reflect that in the shelter. We would rather have a higher ratio of female beds to the homeless population just because of their vulnerability. Right. So that's where we're at by 50 to 50, uh, 50, you know, 50 each. Great. Thank you so much. We're always open to feedback. Um, that's not locked, you know, etched in stone yet. Great. All right, Councillor Cruz, then Councillor Lowe, then Councillor Oak. Thank you all. Yeah, I just, um, I do want to echo other counselors' gratitude for the hard work that's been put into this severe weather sheltering program over the last year and plus. <laughs> um, as somebody who was one of the volunteers in one of those early shelters, I know how much this means to protecting people in the community. Um, and also for folks and constituents who I've talked to who aren't experiencing homelessness, I think that I have heard almost nothing but excitement for keeping people safe in these really extreme events. So um, do know that the work is very much appreciated in the community. And I think um, through all of the things we've learned <laughs> the hard way, I think things are improving and getting better. And so know that that um, is something that you know, people are grateful for. And also I think, you know, speaking to some of the engagement on social media, I think it just reaffirms that this is a point of interest to the community um, and that um, we are on the right track of continuing to um, work in this space and be a leader in this space while hopefully bringing other folks along with us. Um, and so, yeah, and then the final kind of comment before some of my questions, I totally hear you on the uh, organizing food piece. I could totally tell that it was chaotic at points, but I also think, although we are like putting money into the contract with Bayad for food. And I know that they're doing everything in their capacity. I just think that the the level of like nourishment offered with like cup noodles and like peanut butter, like I just don't know if that also creates the most, facilitates the best environment for people in congregate settings. I know that that's gonna change hopefully when things um, move forward, you know, with the great renovations, hopefully slated at, at Recovery Works. But um, since this is gonna be continuing in, for our next season, I do want to emphasize and would um, join with Councilor Mayak Guerrero's uh, <laughs> offer of figuring out how we can do this in a more predictable manner while offering some of these things to people, because I do know it was important and do know it was appreciated by folks who were there. Um, so all that being said, <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, so one, recognizing that, um, you know, this is going to be more of the normal for next season as we continue to move towards greater capacity um what are kind of what are we thinking for you know managing capacity um constraints uh for this next season are we thinking kind of this 50 in this space and and vouchering um or is there other thoughts around kind of managing capacity at this time yeah I, thank you um i i think it will be uh 50 in vouchering uh the the 50s are number right now. Um, we're, in, until a renovation happens, 50s are max. Um, I think this system we have right now, where we're paying for Bayad to provide transportation to those voucher sites, um, it's working. Uh, it's a pretty expensive setup uh, for us as a city and and for the county. But the county hasn't been able to find a way to provide an alternative shelter location. And in, until another city or the county step up, we, we don't really have another option. Um, we don't think it makes sense for the city to create another shelter location 
within the city, we think there are two challenges with that. One, it it spreads our staffing out even more. Um, and two, it, it helps Lakewood become an even greater uh, attractant. Uh, we really need other cities in the county um, to help serve their populations in need and not have those folks necessarily just come to Lakewood for services. Uh, I think um, we'll probably be able to operate uh, with with the voucher set up uh, throughout next winter. Um, I, I don't I haven't heard anything about an, another shelter coming online. So I think um, that's probably where we'll be. We also don't know what the fate of the severe weather shelter network is going to be. Um, the city is evaluating uh, some support for them. Uh, we provided them fifty thousand dollars in support this past year, but uh, it has become a little redundant to the city's shelter, and and maybe not as preferred um, by the unhoused population to ours. So that's something staff's going to have to continue to evaluate. Okay, thank you um, for that information. That's super helpful. Um, yeah, and 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 I'll just flag from like a, a transportation perspective. I know some feedback that I heard from some constituents I was talking with on Colfax was some. A lot of folks are kind of reticent to go to other cities for fear of not being able to come back. Um, and 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 so maybe that is like all figured out in folks' transportation plans, and people just aren't hearing that. But I just wanted to relay that as something that I was hearing from folks on the ground, and that. At least one person I talked to, um, at least their impression was when they got to the shelter, the bus passes were out or there wasn't opportunities for transportation. So that person did end up spending the night um, out on the streets. Um, and so I, again, like, it sounds like there are plans for this, but I do just wanna, I have talked to somebody who at least reflects back that they were turned away. Um, another kind of question I wanted to talk because you brought such great guest speakers. I really wanted to hear um, from folks maybe who are having more con contact with some of our community members like Sergeant Alden and, um, you know, uh, Mr. Wallington, how, what kind of folks feedback on on the ground were on this and, and anything you all thought we should know. Yep, great. Happy to bring them over. And Mr. Ginsburg, obviously, too. Yeah, and, and as they're coming over, um, I'll just say on the transportation piece, yes, um, we, we did have some gaps. It continues to be a really difficult piece of this to solve. Uh, we were really hopeful that the county would be able to step up on that transportation front. Um, they couldn't seem to figure it out. Um, so the city put its resources uh, to work with Bayad um, to at least provide transportation for those voucher uh, nights, but I, I don't know what happens on the back end of that, um, how, how the people might get back to Lakewood. So I think we still have some gaps there to figure out. Um, and I don't know that we'll have great solutions to them. You know, it just is kind of one of the difficult things around this. I know as far as some of the transportation after the incidents or after these severe weather events, um, some of our navigators actually went out the next day and were helping folks with bus passes and things like that who are stranded at hotels in various places, both in Lakewood and in Wee Ridge. That was one of the ways they got people back. <clears throat> and then as far as like feedback from just generally speaking, the community or, or the unhoused population, it seems to be overwhelmingly positive. I mean, they like to have that alternative um, given there's always going to be a chronically homeless population that is not um, interested in using a shelter, so we're never going to get everybody off the streets um, when these severe weather events happen. Um, those who want access to these facilities and want something local that they can use, uh, they seem to be very happy to use it. And I also wanted to make sure to kind of point out, too, as, as we were talking earlier about getting the word out about this. Um, yeah, social media is like great. It's good for a lot of folks, but it's not necessarily directed towards our unhoused population because while some of them have, you know, internet only phones and things like that, not that all of them do. So I really want to give credit to, you know, our team, our navigators, our lead case managers, our uh, mental health co-responders, um, the CAT team in general, and then the PD as a whole, just 
getting out amongst that population and letting them know about the shelter, the nights it's going to be opening, and then also our community partners, both in Recovery Works and Mean Streets and some of those others where we were helping to put up flyers, our um, community outreach court, uh, letting everybody know about this from kind of the ground up because, yeah, not everyone has access to that social media. And to, to speak about uh, how the community is viewing it, um, many people were extremely enthusiastic that that is always a possibility for them. Uh, many have kind of come to count on it. So it's kind of nice for them to have a constant in the community where they know there's going to be a safe place for them during a severe weather event. Uh, we've had some issues with severe weather network where people weren't able to connect with their services um, and so having a low barrier shelter that is well known, it's comfortable, it's trauma informed, uh, really has provided kind of a very safe place for people to um, know that that's there uh, when the weather gets uh, severe. Thank you. I have one more question. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. And just one last question. Thank you all really for that feedback and thank you all for the work that you're doing on the ground to make this possible. Um, know that we all really appreciate um, your efforts, so thank you. Um, the last question I just wanted to ask was, I've gotten some questions from folks in the community and I know we saw that on Lakewood Speaks as well, about kind of the concordance between the ordinance that was passed last year um, and the contract that we have, because our ordinance does speak to, to precipitation and to 32 degrees and so, um, I think that that's creating a little bit of confusion um, from some folks in the community. So I just wanted to ask about kind of moving forward, um, if how we can kind of best align some of our efforts on that. I um, mean, would also echo um, Mayor Pro Tem's thoughts about precipitation being something we need to think through. Yeah, I. So I think again, precipitation is really difficult to predict 48 hours in advance. We we've talked to the National Weather Service; their models are not that accurate accurate 48 hours in advance. Um, I think it's something we can continue to look at, but from a staff standpoint, we would recommend using a temperature threshold only. Um, it's certainly council's prerogative to um, kind of, you know, do whatever whatever you want and, and staff will figure it out. Well. Thank you. Um, gosh, I'm I'm really glad that we're we're having the study session that it's on the books, and I I really appreciate you coming on and giving us this update, Mr. Goldstein, and the entire you know, Sergeant Alden, uh, Mr. Wallington, uh, 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 Mr. Ginsburg, the the whole team. I mean, it's I I just want to briefly echo what other folks have said. I'm I'm really um, grateful. Uh, you know, one second. That is the problem with having having this meeting on in two different places. Um, let me just close this. Uh, my apologies. Um, I think, I think honestly, but just to, to what, echo what Councilor Matt Guerrero and, and others have said, it's incredibly impressive that. Um, that we've been able to accomplish this much in the last year. I think it's really exciting to see. And Mr. Goldstein, I know the the immense amount of work and and hours and and stress and heartache that you've put into this over the last year. So thank you. I think it's really accomplished something. I have a couple of questions, but I wanted to lead with this one. Mr. Goldstein, do we happen to know um like what the 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 numbers are in terms of number of 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 deaths from um from cold weather? maybe in previous years and then this year? Because I have a feeling because of all this this work, that number went down a lot this year. And I, I, I was just curious if we'd looked at that or if not, if that was something we had any ability to track. I don't know previous years. I don't know that we've looked at it. Um, Sergeant Alden might have some information on that. I don't think we had any deaths um, this year in in Lakewood, and maybe not even hospitalizations, but I'll turn it over to Sergeant Alden or um, Mr. Wellington if if he has any thoughts. Yeah, my understanding is there were no deaths attributed to cold weather over the last year. 
I couldn't speak to previous years. Um, the other thing that would be tough to determine is even if someone were to be found deceased um, after a night out in you know the cold weather, um, unless there is no other substance within their system, it's hard to say exactly what it was that brought about that. Um, but my understanding is there were no cold weather deaths this past winter. I'm not surprised to hear that, and I, I really appreciate that. I, I think it speaks to the importance of what we're doing, and I ask that in part to kind of ground this discussion in the stakes. I mean, the, these are, I, I really do believe that this work is saving people's lives in our community, and I, I know that you all are at the front lines of that, so so truly thank you. Um, and again, I, we've said this before, I can't think of just a more serious life or death issue, given that, that this is literally preventing some people from dying. Um, it, to the extent, I, I don't know if we have some sort of process for for getting council, you know, periodic updates when someone does tragically pass. I I would honestly be interested if if it's feasible, if it does, if if the cat team can collect that and, and seeing that. Um, and to the extent that the answer is zero, that's great, and we should I think we should have that be our our north star certainly. Um, I want to echo what's already been talked about. I mean, I I am um, I think Mr. Goldstein, you're exactly right that that we. It's great that Lakewood is leading this, and we've got to get some of our other compatriots in Jefferson County a little more off the sidelines here. Um, I am very committed to doing that. We have some, I know we have some elected officials at the county level who care very deeply and passionately about this issue. Um, I really want to want to figure out how council can support you all. And if if the answer is by getting the county and the city to do more and support Lakewood, so that Lakewood isn't the only actor here, then I think we've all got to really row together on that. And I'm I'm really committed in, in making that point in the most forceful way possible. Um, on, uh, I guess on that point, um, uh, has there been any, so I guess that brings me to, to um, the question of, of capacity, um, which has already been talked about. Um, I hear loud and clear that until this this navigation center grant is implemented, um, the fifty the fifty capacity in, at nights is is a hard limit. Um, first, I think that really underscores the the value and the importance of the nine point five million dollar grant. There was some discussion about the wisdom of that. I think this discussion shows how urgently and desperately needed the, those those improvements were. So, a, a couple questions there. Number one. Totally understand it's going to take some time to do that. I guess I'd be curious from in hearing from Mr. Ginsburg. It sounds like we don't think those retrofits that would expand capacity are going to be ready by next winter. Do we think it's realistic to have in two winters? Um, or is that also going to be a stretch or just too hard to say? Yeah, and certainly in the you know, Lakewood's taken the lead on this and negotiating with the uh, contractors and um the acquisition and when that may close whether it's in a whether it's uh july or the end of the year and then um you know it always has to do with um permitting and contracting and supply chain all those things um but we're certainly we're certainly shooting for the winter of 20 you know 26. um the one concern i do have um and, and it mostly has to do with bathroom capacity and of course no showers right now um for the 50 capacity since there's only two bathrooms um you know there's going to be we don't know when the rehab is going to start and we're going to be negotiating uh running the navigation center while the rehab is happening and you know we're concerned about that and so then you throw in the severe weather into that mix and i just want to sort of put a place marker and a cautionary tell um, that there, you know, there's a chance that facility is not real available next winter if we're in the middle of rehab. Um, hadn't thought of that. That's going to keep um, No, I didn't but... mean to put a rain on the whole parade, but uh, I think it's something that we have to keep in mind. Well, that actually brings me directly to my other question, or one other question. Um, thinking just about how other municipalities can can row together on this, I, I second what the mayor pro tem asked. You know, where's Arvada? The, the, this question of the status of um, their navigation center. I mean, not to minimize the the immense complexity of what you all pulled off with recovery works. It just seems to. I I. 
my two cents is we we ought not to be satisfied with the fact that we are the only game in town a year you know next year um there there needs to be somewhere else somewhere in jefferson county that is able to take on this this overvote population and frankly mr ginsburg's caution uh which i really appreciate mr ginsburg that the renovation could complicate things next winter which totally makes sense i think redoubles the importance of that point so uh, mr goldstein i'm happy to discuss this further with you it doesn't have to be tonight but any just i guess do you agree that that, that count that the part of the solution to this this hard 50 person limit and especially given mr goldstein mr ginsburg's concern about um renovations next winter that we Part of our goal needs to be finding somewhere, somehow, some facility in Jefferson County that can take on some of this overvote population next next winter so that we're not exclusively relying on recovery works. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think even if even if we were operating at 100, um, yeah. you know, there there is more need out there and Lakewood needs to not be the only game in town. There's need throughout the county. Um, so for some folks to get services, you know, the amazing services that are being provided by Recovery Works day in and day out, or on very cold nights, the sheltering that's being provided at 8,000 West Colfax, those folks are traveling a long way to, to seek out those services perhaps. So, you know, if, if you're up in North Arvada, getting to Colfax might not be the easiest thing, um, or if you're in Westminster or even Wheat Ridge, um, you know, so there are other cities in the county that absolutely should be stepping up. Um, everyone has folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, it's not just Lakewood. And I think, um, you know, there's also going to be a significant financial cost to the city um, as we transitioned to 20 degrees. Um, that dramatically increased our nights of operation. So at 32 degrees without precipitation, we operated two nights beginning in February. So there might've been a couple of nights earlier in the year that we would have operated, but at 20 degrees, we could operate up to 50 nights, um, maybe more. Uh, and if council is interested in going with precipitation, that's gonna be many, many more nights. So, you know, there's a there's going to be a significant cost to operating um and it's important that community partners um outside of lakewood are also coming to the table and and the county being the human services provider uh is a pretty important partner there thanks mr goldstein i know others have their hands up just let me touch on a couple other very quick points and i'll i'll hand the mic over here um i agree with that i think if if the county is isn't in the foreseeable future going to provide a dedicated separate site, we really need to lean on them to provide more financial support. I'm interested in exploring transportation support to the point that you raised. Um, I'm, I to I second, third and fourth, what's been said about, you know, if as while we're doing this, can we also look at providing resources during extreme hot weather, which we know from climate change are gonna become more frequent over time and, and are more frequent than they were 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, I second what's been said about donations. I, you know, I I had a chance. I actually brought um, uh, food donations on on a couple of occasions that were provided from amazing restaurants in in Belmar and Ward Three, including um, Little India and T Street Roadhouse, both of which donated quite a bit of food on multiple occasions. Um, I second what Councillor Cruz said. I do. I think it's appreciated um, enormously, uh, and I want to recognize those that have been donating. I also hear you that it that the process has been a little chaotic. Um, I think there is a need here. I, I actually I literally was picking up uh, dinner from Little India tonight, and I mentioned we were talking about this, and he said, "Oh, I want to I want to donate more. I want to donate more. How can I help?" Um, so I I totally understand that city staff don't want to. It's not realistic given given all of the fire drills you're already doing to sort of add that to your plate, um, Mr. Goldstein. But I am interested in this question of how can the city support someone who could coordinate that, whether that's at Recovery Works or Bayod or someone that sits in the city or is it a team effort? But there, I think there's got to be someone who's sort of setting up some sort of more coordinated portal or system 
for local businesses that do want to donate and doing it in a way that's systematic, right? So that it's predictable so that, that we don't have a sudden, a flood of food one night and then peanut butter sandwiches and ramen noodles the next night, right? I, I believe that process can be managed. It's just going to take some some infrastructure and staff support that, that maybe we don't, it is is too much for everyone to juggle right now, but, but I'd like to see us get there. Um, gosh, I have some other points, but I don't want to talk for too long. I mean, my, my most important last question is just what else, beyond what we've already talked about, is there anything else that city council can do to build on this, right? I'm, I'm thinking very specifically about work, you know, looking at, at, at the budget, looking at um, sustaining this long term. Are there other tweaks that you would recommend it to the ordinance itself that would give, you know, you and your team the agency or the flexibility to respond? Um, do you need more staff? Is there anything else that the city needs to do here or the council should look at or, or think about? I don't want to, you don't have to say, yes, you should pass this tomorrow, but something that we ought to look at to kind of build on the work that you've already done over the last year. I think staff Mr. will Bolton, evaluate during I the budget. Sorry, sorry, Mayor. Yeah, no, you're fine. I wanted to step in. So the purpose of tonight's call is to do a really nice look back on what's been happening, but we will have future conversations around that, um, like the continuum of housing, that will be a good time for us to uh, identify spaces, not only with some of the other areas that we've talked about as a body that are important to many of us and many of our residents, but with this one in particular. So, Mr. Goldstein, you may not be prepared to answer that question tonight, and I would offer the council that we will have more opportunities to talk through this. Yeah, totally Looking understood. Forward, totally element. understood, Madam Mayor. I'm just, I'm just sort of trying to leverage, seize the moment to at least start thinking about opportunities on the horizon. Thank you, Mayor Strom, and and Council Member Lowe, I, I think I'll just say kind of broadly, yes, we're looking at this um, homelessness in general. Uh, and, and addressing the needs of the unhoused in our budget process. I, I don't have an answer for you on whether that's additional staff or, or what that might look like. Um, I will say that we built out this year's budget based on 32 degrees. Um, and when we transitioned to 20 degrees, it did result in additional operational nights. So as we're looking at next year's budget, I would anticipate um, maybe a higher number to, to meet a full winter of 20 degrees. Um, so, you know, you might see numbers in the budget to help support those additional operational nights. Um, but I I don't know that I can answer that, uh, particularly in regards to staffing or, or some of the other needs um, to, to address all those services the city is now providing that we haven't historically provided. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. And I apologies for taking so much time. I just, it's, I, the, the urgency of the topic, I think, is 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 compelling. The the last thing I'll say um, is I I think the point you raised you raised in the briefing materials, Mr. Goldstein, about the sort of the, the distinction between eight eight thousand West Colfax and the lack of barriers and the fact that folks can bring their path and pets and don't don't have to pre register for services versus some of the barriers that we've heard repeatedly from stakeholders in Lakewood around the severe weather shelter network are, are significant, are important. These are real, you know, we need systems where folks who are at risk of freezing to death can 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 have a resource without having pre-registered for it um, many, many hours in advance through a bureaucracy, um, which is not to impugn or demean the, the, the important work that anyone does. But I clearly, given the resource constraints, we do need to be very strategic about where we're putting our resources. So I, I honestly am glad that you're you're taking a, a look as we go into next winter at at how to allocate resources and whether severe weather network is 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 the right solution. Um, and and how we also expand our capacity for for beds and and provisions for folks that um haven't pre-registered. Okay, I'll stop talking. Thank you very much. Councilor Over. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll be real quick. Uh, ben, I just wanted to give you kudos on this presentation. This has been one of the more complete reports uh, that I've seen since I've been here. Um, I think you hit all sides and, and what you're doing is a very good thing. Uh, and it looks like you've got this. And so um, thank you <laughs> for, for everything you're doing here. Uh, I only have one worry and that's mission creep. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we, we, I know we started this because people could be freezing to death and we've taken care of that. Uh, and I don't really want to see this go further than keeping that thought in mind 
Um, I'm not worried about windy days. I'm not worried about sunny days. I'm not worried about rainy days. Um, um, and if it, if it got up to like 110, you know, that, that might be something we look at, but, uh, a warm day in Denver isn't all that warm yet. Um, so that's all just thanks. Thanks for being complete on this topic. Thank that's all. All right, Councilor Ryan. Thank you. The, you know, the nice thing is uh, the counselors before me asked so many fantastic questions. I've been crossing them off my list. Um, I will echo Mr. Goldstein, and I hope you'll please convey to uh, all the staff just what a wonderful job that all of you have done, not only in getting this up and running, but uh, to actually operate this. And then and I echo Councillor Olver's uh, comments about this has been a fantastic presentation. The one thing that a number of us, and I know you mentioned in your presentation, we all want to see somebody else in Jeffco uh, open up a navigation center. And you said that there may be ways that we as individuals or city councilors can help. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Maybe I misunderstood your comment. Yeah, I, I can a little bit. Um, I, you know, it, it's a difficult question. Um, because it's political. Um, so I think, you know, it might come down to if you have a peer in another city that you have a good working relationship with, having that conversation with them and, and helping encourage them. Certainly Kathy is doing that on the executive side, um, talking to fellow city managers and county manager um, and, and kind of putting the pressure on there. But I think you all have seen, or many of you have seen firsthand the political courage it takes to do something like this uh you know the the night that uh the dola grant was accepted w was you know one of the highest capacity meetings i've seen in lakewood um so it is political courage so you know i think helping maybe share um with other electeds in in the county and in cities and throughout the county that it's worth it um or you know, that you've seen success on the other side, they're going to be making their own political calculation. So I don't know that, you know, you can necessarily walk in their shoes because every city is a little different. But I think that is kind of what I have in mind um, so that, you know, we're doing what we can on the administrative side. And ultimately, in many cases, it's a political decision for a city. Thank you. And then, you know, I understand from the, the, the mayor's comments that the, the purpose of this uh, discussion is maybe perhaps a little more limited than than we might uh, want to go into some other territory. But I would hope that uh, when we have those future discussions that the city can come back to us with if there are obstacles in expediting the permitting process and other construction process from the city's perspective to allow Mr. Ginsburg's uh, uh, and, and the, the renovation to occur as quickly as possible. I, I hope that the city will engage the city council uh, at the earliest possible time if there are obstacles in our current code that are holding us back in expediting that because I think we would all like to try and avoid having renovations uh, occurring during the winter of 2026. Um, so if we could do that. And then my last piece is if the um, our, uh, Sergeant Alden, if there are, and again, you, you don't have to provide comment now, but um, if you and your team could be thinking about what things in terms of policies or changes that will help uh, allow you to do your job better and convey those to Mr. Goldstein to order other city staff to come back to city council. I'd very much appreciate any, any suggestions on changes that you would like to see. That's it. Say yeah, absolutely. We can come up with a wish list. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just could, say could we put it. Can we put some sort of time frame in, in mind? And I, I don't want to make something arbitrary, but uh, Mr. Goldstein, could at some point in time you can say, hey, we'll have a, a follow-up report to you guys by 
you know, September, some, some date. But so I don't know when um, we're going to be able to schedule kind of the broader discussion that will be the follow up to this. Um, but yes, we are working on that and and we will do it uh, kind of there. You know, there there are many things at play, so we want to have it be the most worthwhile and not have, you know, a piece just hanging out there um, where we can't speak to it. So I don't know what the timing will look like, but we will be coming back to you. I can say as far as the recovery works piece and getting through the, you know, zoning and building, uh, the city will be assisting the management of that renovation project. And in doing so, we'll be submitting the permits to ourselves. Um, so yes, we will do our very best to make it an expedited process. Uh, there, there might be, uh, you know, some zoning changes or other things like that, that could be coming to city council. And, you know, as we talk through this project, um, or, or maybe to the planning commission, you know, we'll make sure that all those are expedited and not no city process will be holding up, uh, this project. I think it's really going to come down to uh, a very significant renovation and contractors and supply chain, as Mr. Ginsburg spoke to. There, there's a lot of components that are going to come into this project, and it's going to be significant. So, I think you know, if maybe I can just ask of City Council to have patience. Um, it's it, this is not an overnight fix. Um, addressing the needs of the unhoused is challenging, and. I know you all are eager um, for us to do more and be better, but patience is probably the biggest thing we can ask for as, as we work through this. We want to do it right. Um, and I think being uh, safe and and doing it right is, is probably the most important thing to us. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, then Councillor Nystrom. Thank you. I will be super quick. I echo concerns about timeline and not being open in the kind of especially January, February months of 2025. So I know that that's going to be something that's on everybody's radar and just want to echo that that would be a huge concern of mine as well. Um, and the only other thing that I will say is that when we did pass our severe weather ordinance, it was 20 degrees and dry, um, 30 degree, 32 degrees with precipitation and did not specify an amount of precipitation, which I realize is difficult to predict, but just precipitation, um, period. So um, perhaps that that might make it a little bit easier to kind of determine, um, would be happy to reopen that discussion and relook at what a appropriate with precipitation um, threshold might be given that I know, um, you know, that's going to increase our operational costs. But, um, you know, the, the reason that we did pass an ordinance that included a with precipitation clause is because humidity in the air and wet on the ground just changes when temperature gets dangerous. So I just want to say that I <laughs> would love for that to be top of mind on the priority list. Um, I don't think we need a amount of snow on the ground threshold. I don't think that's the point of the precipitation um, difference. It's that it's wet and wet makes cold different um, and the results of cold different. So would just like to speak to my support of perhaps re-looking at that. Councilor Nystrom. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, again, Mr. Goldstein, Mr. Ginsburg, um, everybody that's been involved, I think the work you guys have done has absolutely been commendable. Very appreciative of that. Um, Mr. Ginsburg, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear you're working with the designer for the Dolores project because I think that's been a great facility and has done a lot of good work. And so that probably bodes well for your success. Um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm pleased to hear about, we're already thinking about expediting permits and things of that nature. 
um, as as things progress. I guess just my operational background, I'm already thinking of contingency planning for next year. So hopefully in the next session, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit because I, I think we have more awareness in the community now. And I think that will help us maybe r rally some volunteers as needed because we won't have the same structure and we're going to need everybody we can get. So, you know, within our own wards and, um, you know, uh, community uh, involvement and communication, we could probably start building a coalition that will help out as needed. So um, just food for thought. But again, thank you. All right, and before we hand it off to Councillor Matt Guerrero for another question, I had one that didn't actually get answered or asked earlier. I was curious if we being city or maybe PD is tracking any metrics of response um, because the reality is, yes, we're talking about things that cost money, but we also know that it costs money uh, when we're not doing things and when it's just a response from our agents showing up um, or code enforcement showing up, you know, responding to encampments and things like that. And I'm wondering if there's been any tracking or, well, any tracking maybe that started that might inform where we may be saving money through this work. Mr. Wellington, I don't know if you can speak to it. I did just try and add Sergeant Alden back to the meeting. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, he uh, his uh, Zoom crashed. Um, there's the metrics that we use is two things. There's calls for service that either come through the call screen uh, through Jeffcom or GoGov, which can be accessed through uh, liquid.org. Uh, both of those are how we kind of track our calls for service. Um, and then the other navigator and myself, we keep a list and we keep metrics of the people that we serve. Uh, so we keep uh, those for those encounters that aren't necessarily um, law enforcement engagements, but more um, outreach and social work and case management that we do. Thank you. Sergeant Alden, before I accidentally cut you off, did you want did you want to add anything there? He may not have his audio back. I don't okay, know. Okay, well we'll go ahead and hand we'll hand it over to um Council Mia Guerrero. Thank you. I'm gonna be a little more rapid fire because I know we need to move on. Um but I, this really is so informative and I think it, it really will influence like especially from the HPC perspective, like we'll, what we need to be pushing on because it's already happening, right? It's just really, really helpful. Um, I, just to follow up on that specific question that Mayor Strom just asked, another thing that I imagine we have not as good of data on is emergency room services. Um, like the cost of emergency room services if you are freezing or you realize you're really sick in the middle of the night and you end up in the emergency room instead of Right, like that is a much more expensive taxpayer burden mm -hmm. than, right? So, and I, I doubt we have that data, but that's just another thing I'm thinking about. We don't necessarily have that data, but we do have a uh, kind of a program that we use. We partner with the West Metro uh, Fire Department with their arm car, which is an urgent care on wheels. Mm -hmm. And we got to the unhoused community uh, four times a month. And from there with our case management, so that people don't have to rely on emergency services to get their medical needs met. We connect them with longer term services and um, ongoing care through Stride, MedNow and other programs so that we can also reduce that burden. Because uh, we understand that also our unhoused community doesn't necessarily get the treatment that they need in the emergency room, nor are they treated respectfully. So we're trying to create a way where we can kind of address those issues so it does reduce the burden on emergency services, emergency rooms, and first responders. I, I think I meant specifically during uh, severe weather events. Yeah, for, right. during severe, that's, I mean, we don't have that data. One of the things that we are trying to do is get ahead of each storm. And so mm -hmm. through our outreach efforts, we are providing 
information, bus passes, warm, wet warming gears, hand warmers, foot warmers, thermal blankets, gloves, hats, whatever we can. Uh, so for those people who do choose to stay or may not be able to access, uh, we can at least minimize the damage of severe weather on a person's health. I, I really appreciate that you do that work and that you're doing everything you can to prevent those emergency room <laughs> visits because, of course, to your point, they're not as um, effective for the health of that individual. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think my point was also following up on Mayor Strom's fiscal point where we talk so much about how expensive these things are. But like the cost of an ambulance ride is much more expensive than us driving someone to a voucher. Right. So that to me is like if you wake up in the middle of the night still on the street you realize you're freezing to death mm -hmm. and you try to get yourself to an emergency room or you manage to call an ambulance and it comes, right? Like that is also a really severe fiscal burden. It's not as directly on like the Lakewood balance budget. It's like harder to calculate, but that is still within our economic stress and like the county's stress and like Medicaid stress, right? So these are, um, I just, I want to just continue to support, I think Mayor Strom was making an excellent point that this is not, in fact, taking from a zero-sum game. It's adding to the the total, like, it, it's like adding still within the same pie, right? Like, it's the same people who are needing resources. Like, providing resources does not increase homelessness. We know that as a fact, right? And so it, it might, right, like, to um, Mr. Goldstein's point that, like, we're the only service for miles in any direction, if that's going to be a very burdened spot, right? And that's, I'm not trying to say that that doesn't happen. But my point is that if all these folks are already here and they're already experiencing like the potential emergency needs, health needs, et cetera, um, and that level of burden on our system is also a problem. And I don't know if any of you have ever just needed to be in an emergency room or a hospital during a winter storm, but it's like, not the same as when it's nice out. The amount of human beings, both from car accidents, um, you know, and, and those kinds of weather related issues and also the influx of people who don't have anywhere else to go and who and who have then therefore been injured. Right. Um, and are sick and have to be in the emergency room. It's it's much more. It's like very intense. Just I know that anecdotally it was one time, you know, but I just want to offer that as, a, as an additional cost aside. But in the cost question, recognizing that we do still have limited city resources specifically, um, not to be flippant about that ever, the um, do we have a commitment from the county that they are going to uh, commit the same amount or more for their voucher program to us next year, next season? I, like, I know uh, the budget's not done, but like, is that what we think is going to happen? I don't know that I can speak to that. Um, Mr. Wellington, I don't know if you've heard anything uh, along those lines yet. No, we have not heard anything. Yeah. So, okay. I, you know, I think we'll certainly um, be advocating for that, uh, but the county is increasingly talking about their own fiscal constraints. Um, so I I don't know, you know, it's it's we're very thankful that they came to the table this year with vouchers, but it wasn't necessarily a coordinated approach in advance of the cold weather season. Um, so it, mm -hmm. it's hard to not be able to rely on it. Um, and if they aren't providing the vouchers, the city um, would probably be in a tough position to provide that level of overflow through the voucher system, um, just due to the financial constraints. Um, I, yeah, I, also I Sorry, oh, I did not. I, no. I was just going to say, I think it, to address uh, the question that both you and Mayor Strom asked kind of in regards to uh, the other financial costs of uh, unhoused on, on the city or on the broader community, I think the thing that's so great about what's happening at 8,000 West Colfax is that it's not just providing shelter for that night. It's providing access to all the services that Mr. Ginsburg and, and Recovery Works mm -hmm. put put out there. And, and they work in concert with our navigators and our navigators have an amazing opportunity to connect with folks and our mental health providers can connect with folks at that site. Um, so it, it really creates uh, 
a path out of homelessness. So I think you know, talking about that cost, it if if you think about this service we're providing through the emergency shelter as an ER, it really is that and kind of that continuum of care. But the goal is not to have someone to see the ER. The goal is to, you know, whether you admit them to the hospital and they end up, you know, seeking other care or you get them well in that and then they move on their way. You know, that's that's really what's happening. So if if all we had was the shelter, it would be great, but it wouldn't be nearly as amazing as what is actually happening with Mr. Ginsburg and his team and and other services provided by the city. Thank you so much for highlighting that important point. And of course, this might be the time that brings somebody in for the first time and then they don't have anything terrible happen to them. And they're like, oh, I can come back for resources. So I hope we see that. Um, I have another question, which is on um, like access to federal dollars. So this grant came from DOLA that really, really helps, right? In terms of our financial burden, recovery works financial burden, we're able to do this massive project. We would never have been able to do that. Um, is there, is there currently any, and maybe this isn't like the right question, but like, I know that we've looked at grants, we get, we're good at finding, um, funding beyond, you know, our general fund for these kinds of efforts. And I wonder if there's any, are there barriers for us accessing like all of that possible federal or state money because we are not a county? Like, is that maybe an additional thing to look to with the county collaboratively? I don't, I don't. Know that I think that's the barrier. I think the challenge is probably more so the need for operational dollars as opposed to capital dollars. Um, a lot of times the grants are focused on capital. Um, so the city did just apply um, for multiple grants, one of which was for uh, temporary housing um, for for the unhoused and. Uh, we anticipate also applying during the congressional process for that, but uh, it, that's a capital thing. So, okay. you know, our, our real need, um, you know, we, we got the $9.5 million or so through DOLA, which was kind of a pass through of federal dollars, but the, the operational dollars are going to be challenging um, on an ongoing basis. Mr. Ginsburg, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all as far as, um, you know, grants you've applied for in the past or, or the challenges in in seeking federal dollars yeah i mean i do want to say that the county has been a a, a great partner um in bridging the gap between just recovery works resources when we open the navigation center and still waiting on a contract for, uh, with the state to operate this and so they've they've taken some of the burden in carrying us um and I think they're probably utilizing, uh, well, I know they are federal ARPA dollars for that. And then they also came alongside to help us with the purchase of the motel for our bridge housing program. So they certainly, and then, um, you know, they're certainly wanting to partner and wanting to find ways to support us um, and to support the whole system and the, and the rehousing infrastructure that we're trying to create. I think that you know, there's a lot of different ways to access federal dollars. We certainly really maxed out these ARPA dollars that came through the Transformational Homeless Response Grant and the Navigation Grant. And we're really fortunate to, to capture a lot of that, which of course was all federal dollars through the state. Um, I, I can't say that being a city, you know, and then I, you know, I don't know where, um, you know, where the income get, cap that the county still is, you know, of course, burdened by by the. Um, yeah, Tabor. Yeah, Tabor. But I, I want to emphasize that the county has been partnering and continues to look for ways to um, partner on resources. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that. I, I do want to just echo what. Uh, Councillor Lowe said, too. I, I know that the county is trying to figure out how to show up. They are also, right, this is a problem that dramatically, like, was a problem that was under-resourced and then exponentially increased over COVID. And, like, we have not seen any, like, slowing down and relief of that, right? And so I just want to recognize that they also 
are dealing with new things. I I know that they're not trying to abandon us. It's I'm looking for ways to help help each other. Um, so my last uh, two, last last two. Um, well, I I think I have a couple of things. I know you're talking about heat, and one of my concerns, actually, more than heat in Denver, is uh, air quality and fire season, particularly for like people who have health issues, young people. Um, you know, we've heard personal stories from people who either are or have been on housing have lost family members to illness and air quality during fire season with an inverted ozone you know we're seeing air quality that's hitting three over 300 occasionally and like that is a very different health risk um than even even 220 uh once you hit those 300 levels it's really really significantly different i have really gentle asthma i use my inhaler like twice a year Unless that's what's happening, I won't go outside because I will I will not really be able to breathe well. And I'm pretty healthy. Like, I run, you know. So I just want to flag that as, like, another as you're as you need to figure out over time. Um, and I also want to say, because we are leading on this, which I think is really fabulous, um, I wonder if there's opportunity for us to, as city council, I think we could help with some of the, like, relationship and in you know inviting and probably even some of the logistics, I'm I'm happy to help. Um, but the idea of really encouraging some of our like staff and other electeds to come to work to learn to maybe even, like maybe we could even long term do like a workshop on best practices and how we've figured out how to do this. Um, again, I don't need to have anything concrete tonight, but I was just really thinking like. That's still staff time and that's still expensive, but that is much cheaper than us still being the only resource. And I'm like, how do we like have a convening where we teach people, we help share and we like create plans. Like, and I know the county does some of that. So there's that. And then my last thing is that I just want to say that when I was first elected, I was mostly told that, um, there was no way we could ever have the budget for running at any level of, of human services, particularly not of this scale, that like we could maybe do public private partnerships, but we would have to be a very, very small component of it. And that we, as because we're not a county, are not capable or like we be able to have um, like this level of sheltering, of provided services, uh, right? And, and we figured it out and we innovated. And so I just, I know that we're not supposed to be looking at the future Maristrom, but I have to say the idea that we had a successful program and we might have none of those beds or less of those beds next winter is not tolerable. We can only increase beds. That is the only option we have. We are increasing the amount of people that are unhoused because we're in an economic crisis. We are in a housing crisis where people above 80% AMI cannot afford to live. And like we are in a circumstance where 70 percent of the state of Colorado is one paycheck away from losing their housing. That is the vast majority of us. That's probably most of us on council. That we are six months of money. You know, we are one bad medical thing. All of us. I mean, I don't know any of your personal finances. Maybe some of you aren't. But unless you have some level of like generational wealth. Or you have a very, very good career, which I'm so pleased for you. You're much closer to that than you are to Jeff Bezos. And like, I just want to, and I and I know, I, I don't think that Mr. Goldstein, that you have any level of, of flippantness on this. I don't think any of the staff have any level of not knowing this, but I just want to reiterate and re-encourage that political boldness, that political courage that you were talking about, because it can be difficult, especially when we think we've done it, <laughs> that we cannot have less than 50 beds available, especially if we don't know if the county will have vouchers. If we have to, if we have to figure out how to use city property, if we again, which I know is difficult and sort of terrible in lots of ways, but perhaps with longer time we can figure it out. We are a city of brilliant, innovative, and compassionate people, and we can absolutely figure out how to not have less than fifty beds for emergency weather next winter. And that is all. I apologize for my monologue. Uh, thank you, Council of the Bureau, for your patience. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And how do I how do I top that? Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Gold, uh, Goldstein, thank, thanks again for the presentation. I just kind of want to jump in a little bit. And 
just to kind of ground the conversation. And and if you don't have an answer today, I think that's fine. But I was just kind of curious. I am because this uh, part of what the city is doing in terms of its business is uh, a bit new to me because obviously we weren't doing this when I was on council uh, before. So I'd love to get a sense of how much money we are spending annually for our operation costs and contracts and all that, because I think, you know, that'll give me a good sense of, you know, uh, what additional resources, you know, we might be able to bring to the table as a council or, or if we uh, are, you know, putting uh, more than we, you know, it'll just give me a better sense of context. Uh, so I think us knowing those uh, dollar amounts would be very helpful. So I don't know if you want to speak to that now or if you can provide maybe get some documents or a, a memo or something like that later. I, I can speak to it uh, to some extent now. Uh, you know, it, it's a broader number than just um, each right. operational night. But since tonight's discussion is focused on the cold weather shelter, uh, it's about $5,000 a night to operate that shelter. Um, so it adds up pretty quick. Um, there are also additional um, costs that aren't necessarily included in that in staff time and, you know, a whole bunch of soft costs for the city. Uh, all the pre-work that's done by the CAT team and the navigators to get people to the shelter and get people out of the cold it would not be in that number. Um, so that's just essentially our, you know, kind of a ballpark of our operational costs was they had to operate the shelter each night. Okay. Do we? How many days was it open? I, uh, if you know, <laughs> sorry to put you 20, on the spot. Around twenty or so. Um, probably a little less than that. I think. Okay. All right. Well, and I'm just trying to put it in context because obviously, you know, a lot of decisions uh, we make throughout the year, you know, obviously could influence how much resources uh, we have to sort of support this kind of initiative and and of course it's always out of context because we're always talking about the city as a whole and not necessarily in individual programs but i'm just wanted to flag that next week we're talking a little bit about potentially putting a moratorium on the business and occupation tax i think i got a number back that that could cost us a couple hundred thousand um and then last year i know the council we you know lowered the property tax uh, by about a million dollars. So I'm, I'm just bringing those things up uh, as obviously these are potential resources that could be going to, you know, these kind of projects. And I think it's, you know, behooves us to, to keep that in mind. Um, also, uh, just related since I'm on the legislative committee, I think since we are talking about uh, resources and, and what we might need, uh, obviously the city can't do everything alone. So I think that's just something else to flag and think about for next legislative session about, you know, what resources or support we might need from the state and, hey, we should be going to the state and advocating for those uh, resources and, and and perhaps even the feds, you know, thinking about our experience with NLC uh, and whatnot. Obviously, uh, next week, we're also talking about CDBG funds. So CDBG funds obviously could potentially support our vouchers, maybe enhance our vouchers. So I think you know, we need to be thinking about these things whenever we um, approve these plans, uh, you know, where we want to put resources. Um, so, I, and and I also want to have a broader conversation about CDBG funds at some point, because I know there's some financing uh, mechanisms in there with that section, 108 section, I think it's called, or something like that. Anyway, um, but I just want to flag that since obviously we'll be having that conversation uh, next week. And I do remember when I was on council years ago, at one point we were uh, reducing the amount of vouchers uh, from CDBG funds. Um, I haven't looked exactly where we're at uh, now, but I just, I do remember that happening uh, years ago and I was not in support of that. Um, so anyway, uh, appreciate it, Mr. Goldstein. Love to learn more and chat with you more about this uh, sort of offline just to get more of your perspectives and stuff. I uh, really appreciate you sharing with us a little bit you know about the resources and, and just your whole presentation and also mr ginsburg as well for being here thanks thanks everyone and everybody's thoughtful questions all right um thank you everybody for as Councilor labier said um the very thoughtful questions lots of um lots of things to hash through and 
all in a the beginning of a journey of addressing this important need within our community and with that, the beginning of um, a lot of learning and finding opportunities to do better. So I you know, want to send a huge thank you out to uh, all of our staff that were here tonight, Mr. Ginsburg for joining us tonight and Mr. Goldstein for the preparation you put not only in to the presentation tonight, but the uh, mid-year report that you put together uh, a few weeks back as well. So thank you everybody for being here to um, contribute to the conversation. We will go ahead now and shift to our um, topic number two for the evening. Um, with that, that topic is uh, proposed modifications regarding parkland dedication and improvement. Now, quick reminder that there are comments on Lakewood Speaks um, and some may still even be rolling in. So a note to counselors, please make sure to check that um, through the evening tonight and uh, after tonight's meeting um, before tomorrow. And with that, I will go ahead and one note before I hand it over to Director Newland to kick us off on this presentation. So um, we in our retreat had, uh, and you know, we've been working for lots of ways that we can as a city council body work in a more effective, effective, effect, functional, I don't even know what the word I'm trying to say, um, efficient, there it is, way, um, and working through updates of our policies and procedures. And one of the things that we talked about at retreat is um, kind of self-limiting ourselves to five minutes. In fact, we have these lovely little timers to keep us accountable. Um, I know this topic, this last topic was very, very passionate for many of us. And just a quick reminder that if five of us, or if all 11 of us take five minutes, it is at a base, 55 minutes. So just um, asking everybody to be mindful of the time and um, where we can not have too much redundancy and just notice that, you know, this is such a, an important topic as well. But again, we're trying to make sure that we get lots of time available for questions for everybody. And I want to thank you all for um, the humor that is going into this. <laughs> so just to, as we move forward into our second, it kind of a reinsert um, as to self-monitor and try to keep our comments and questions to five minutes. Um, with that, Director Newland, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you for our presentation. There is a lot of information on Lakewood Speak, so anybody joining us tonight or after tonight's meeting, there is a lot of backstory, a lot of um, additional details, numbers will be talked probably ad nauseum tonight. All of those numbers can be found on liquidspeaks.org. So please feel free to navigate to that. As you're making public comments, you'll be able to see the documents available to review that deeper as well. And with that, um, Director Nguyen, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kit Newland, Director of Community Resources. Um, so tonight we are gonna be talking about land dedication and fees in lieu. And I wanna start first by introducing the staff and the consultants that we'll be presenting to you tonight. We'll have um, Amber Till, and she's our public engagement and operations manager. Ross Williams from our staff also, He'll, he's the land design and facility management administrator. And then with Norris Design, our consultants will have speaking, Kurt Friesen, and then also with him, a couple of other um, Cohorts, Elise Applegate and Clancy Mullen will be joining us for any questions that you all may have. As you know, the last update of this chapter was done in 2018. This is the chapter of the code 16.14 was adopted by council in 2018 and the original ordinance was established in 1983. There are a couple of items to keep in mind as we go through the presentation. First, um, remember Lakewood is an infill city there's not a lot of opportunity for growth. The growth that is happening in Lakewood right now is generally going up rather than out. Parkland dedication ordinances are generally set up for cities where there's room for growth and there's lots of additional parkland availability. The overall goal is to ensure that all residents, both new and current, get equitable access to parks and open space. Additionally, it's interesting to keep in mind that the city of Lakewood has is 25% of our current land is parkland. However, 
We all know that there's a couple of areas in the city that are severely lacking in park space, and those are mostly in the northern and eastern parts of the city. So this study session is just an opportunity for us to share with you how we've been using the parkland <clears throat> dedication and fees in lieu, um, how it's been working, especially since updated in 2018. And we wanna share, um, hear from you, all the feedback and questions that you have. It's really just an opportunity for all of us to learn from each other. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amber who will be starting the presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, chapter 14.16, that is 14.16, not 16.14, of Park and Open Space Dedication defines and codifies that all residential land uses shall dedicate land to the city park sites and open space areas in accordance with the title. The current ordinance requires 5.5 acres per new 1,000 residents. The Director of Community Resources may require payment of a fee in lieu of the dedication or may require dedication of a smaller amount of land than would otherwise be required. And then, of course, that fee for the remaining portion not dedicated. The Director may also accept improvements of equal or greater value, the fee that would have been collected. Fees accepted remain within one of seven planning districts within the city and are used for park improvements in the corresponding district in which the development occurred. There is a list of how those funds have been utilized in, since 2018 in your packet tonight. All residential development greater than 14.99 acres must dedicate land. And then, of course, we're here tonight because there are also recognized limitations of this ordinance. The land dedication requirement has limited feasibility of many residential infill development. There is a lack of a simplified method in which to update the land values. Due to limited resources, parcels of less than three acres can create maintenance and services challenges. There is also a lack of flexibility in the use of funds where needed in underserved areas. And then lastly, something we'll talk about a little bit more later is that the fee in lieu is currently too low as compared to recent property values. As Kit mentioned, as an infill community, Lakewood faces this unusual challenge. We have limited growth potential we also really need to balance that need for housing, like we just discussed earlier tonight, um, with open spaces to recreate and adequate parks. I will now turn the presentation over to Ross Williams to tell you more about the history of parkland dedication. Thank you, Amber. The city's original parkland dedication requirements were first, first codified back in 1983 as a result of recommendations outlined in the city's comprehensive plan as well as the Parks, Leisure, and Open Space Master Plan of 1982. Prior to that time, land dedications were negotiated with large area developers, which can work very well if there's land to grow into. The intent of the parkland dedication requirements was to ensure the level of service established by those planning documents for the city were continued in future developments, and the cost of continuing that level of service for new residents was placed on the new residents moving in, not the current residents of the city or the existing residents of the city. Um, just a side note on the, the, the first codification, I was uh, one of the co-authors of that when we, one of the first assignments I had was to get this into our codes there. From the beginning, there has been a blend of land dedications and fee in lieu of dedications. With fees being collected, the dominant method to satisfy the requirement. A list of notable uh, parcels de dedicated to meet the parkland dedication requirements is in your packet for tonight's meeting. In 2018, the City Council made some modifications to the dedication requirements uh, at our recommendation, but also uh, a lot of Council recommendations in there. And one of the recommendations was to review the requirements every five years, and that's where we are tonight. In your packet, you'll find copies of the yearly report of fees that were collected and how the fees were used to improve the park system to accommodate the additional residents. An example of where we are planning to use the fees are shown on the slide, in this particular case, um, Two Creeks Park. Uh, and that's where a, a large amount of fees will be used this year. What we have seen in the last five years has been a significant uptick in the number of dwelling units being built, primarily in the single family attached and the multifamily housing types. 
in most cases, the city has the city has chosen to require fees in lieu of land dedications. This has been due to several factors. Uh, one, the calculated dedication for each development has been too small and would not provide a significant usable park space if it had been taken by itself. The uh, land dedication did not pre did not present an opportunity to aggregate with other usable uh, sites adjacent to it or dedications adjacent to it to create a usable public site. And they were not adjacent to existing parks or trail corridors in areas of high need. Going into the future, it is important to note that the city regularly identifies areas of the city not meeting the adopted parks and open space standards. Several recent studies, including the Imagine Tomorrow planning effort in 2023, the strategic acquisition plan developed by the Conservation Fund in, in 2019, and the walkable park access studies all have identified a lack of parkland in the north and eastern areas of the city. These can, tools can help us identify where we need to accept land and have private or have private park space be required. We are constantly looking at parcels to determine their suitability to meet our community needs through our acquisition studies and, and reviewing the whole neighborhood. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Kurt from Norris Design and he'll take through their review and recommendations. Kurt? Yeah, thank you, Ross. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, Kirk Friesen with Norris Design. Norris Design was hired to complete a detailed assessment of the existing ordinance and park dedication methodologies, as well as study the viability of park impact fees. To begin the project, we identified three primary goals. The first goal was to reimagine parks and open space dedications within an infill community, such as Lakewood. Uh, infill development provides unique opportunities and challenges and the ordinance needs to better address those. Our second goal was to maximize parks and open space with an equity lens. The map on this slide was prepared as part of the Imagine Tomorrow plan and identifies underserved areas in the city today. And our recommendations will be responsive to the needs of these community members. And then finally, the last project goal was to improve transparency. By creating better maps and tools for staff in the development community, we believe we can make the process a little more user friendly. First step in the process was to listen. Um, we reached out to the development community to gather their feedback. We, can, we uh, conducted a work session that included developers, Lakewood Advisory Commission members and city staff. We also conducted a listening session with neighborhood residents, including members of the Imagine Tomorrow Master Plan Advisory Committee. And both of these meetings were excellent. They really provided tremendous perspective and helped guide the project and our ultimate recommendations. Next slide, please. Uh, a few quick key questions that were discussed in these meetings included, what are the pros and cons of adding a park impact fee? And is that the right solution for Lakewood? Number two, should we expand parkland dedication requirements to non-residential development? Should commercial development be considered? And then number three, how can we provide additional parks in areas with limited land availability, particularly in multifamily developments, which is a high percentage of new development occurring in Lakewood? Following these meetings, our team developed some preliminary recommendations with the goal of simplifying the overall approach. Our preliminary recommendations include one, continue parkland dedications based on locations where park deficiencies are identified. We believe there's some additional mapping work to be done to accurately identify those areas. Number two, update the park improvement fee in lieu based on fair market value. As part of this, we recommend keeping the affordable housing provision, which would provide the director the ability to waive all or a portion of the fee for individual housing units set aside for households earning no more than 80% of the area median, median income. Number three, update the projected population per unit, particularly for multifamily development, 
this is based on census and American household survey data. Number four, provide alternative park provision options. This would enable developers to construct compact parks that comply with city uh, defined standards, have public access easements, and would be maintained by the HOA or developer long term. These may include plaza spaces, dog parks, gardens, trail segments, and drainage area improvements. And then lastly, the team decided not to recommend impact fees at this time, as an impact fee is best suited for communities without land dedication requirements. This summarizes our recommendations. There's much more detail on each of these provided in the memo and other materials that were provided to you. With that, I'll hand it back to Amber. Thank you, Kurt. All right, everyone. So that leads us to our next steps. Um, we we want to make sure that that we're very uh, clear that these preliminary recommendations are just our first step in the process. Think of it as an incremental approach. Also, given the disparity in our current fee in lieu and recent property values, staff has included in your packet an, a raised fee in lieu in the existing parkland dedication policy. That was after completing a thorough analysis of both um, recent park acquisitions along with uh, park appraisals that we had available over the last five years. This increased fee isn't a final recommendation, but rather an approach that we can take now knowing that we have more work to do as we turn into this assessment that Kurt's team is working on us with. So then step two, following this meeting, the draft Parkland dedication assessment will be prepared in accordance with council's direction tonight. We also hope to host uh, at least a month long public engagement effort on lakewoodtogether.org where we would provide educational material and more tools around the recommendations and have that open ideally for the month of May for the public to provide feedback. And then we, as Kurt mentioned, we will expand on the Imagine Tomorrow equity mapping with the goal that at the end of this process, we have a very transparent map that we can provide to both the developers and the community of where those areas of greatest need are. And that would influence where we um, require parkland dedication. It's also important to note that in many areas, there are small compact parks that could be another tool that staff could use to meet park needs and to build an overall equitable system, which are, is our ultimate goal. Lastly, staff will then make adjustment based on what we hear from the community and council to modify the Parkland dedication ordinance. Staff has tentatively scheduled the first and second reading with council for in June for adoption, and um, you know we can modify that as needed as we work through this process. And that concludes our presentation. I'll hand it back over to Mayor Strom. Thank you. You're muted, Councilor, I mean, Mayor Strom. <laughs> Okay, weird. I was muted in one, but not two. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. Has to occur at least once a night. Um, before I hand it over to council comments and questions, I wanted to give a big shout out of gratitude to our community resources department for, you know, last year as we were going through the big parks master plan, identifying the need that we needed to really get a little bit more granular with this one particular thing. And not only doing that, but but realizing that the importance of getting this right was one that also um, really entailed bringing in outside experts. So thank you to Norris and company for joining us on this process. It really means a lot for you to have. Um, I know you're very specialized in this type of work. So thank you for adding that to the conversation that we've got tonight. And really excited to see that we're looking at this not only through the lens of maximizing park and open space, which we all know is very important to a really good residence, but also improving transparency in the process. It was a complicated process that may still be a complicated process after, um, but there's definitely things that we can do to make it to be easier to, to understand, easier to implement, and easier to change as we move through this. Um, and likewise, also gratitude for including uh, affordable housing about 
um, through this, knowing how important it is that we not add more barriers to that. So thank you to all of you that did you know, all the work to prepare for this evening. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and open it up. Does council have any questions? I can't believe I don't have any. Can I scare everybody off? We don't have any hands up. <laughs> so, okay, so we'll go with Mayor Pro Tem Sharazai, Councilor Stewart, and then Councilor LeBure. Uh, yes, thanks, Mayor, and thanks, staff, so much for the, the great content of this presentation. Um, a couple of things. I, I'm sorry if I like should know this, but the seven districts, like where is that map? I didn't understand what that was. Um, so I'm looking at the park fee. Um, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the history and, and there's seven districts listed. Like, what are those? And where do I find those maps? So that would be one question. Um I appreciated there was some public comment just about uh, evaluation annually in this. And I would love for us to start to get a shorter timeline on like determining this. And I think annualizing that makes a lot of sense. Perhaps there could be some, um, you know, presentation to city council and sort of what's happened with parkland dedication, with fees that have been collected with this, but to go five years feels like a long time. And I know that there was a recommendation to annualize that, so I would I would recommend that. I know that there was one um, member of the community pointed out that there's some variance in the language in the staff memo, but I would err on the side of the annualized. And then I wanted to point out one piece from the Norris paper, just the 1B of um, park land dedication requirement, and uh, just semantics of required parkland dedication with developments and identified zones where practical. Where practical is like so subjective. So I see a member from the consulting firm has some smiles on that. Like, I don't know if we need to be so hard and fast on that, but I just think like this is such a, an important topic that we don't want to get. We I certainly wouldn't want to put staff in a position where they are you know, this gets like politicized, like I'd like to make this as clean as possible. And I think that that's everyone's endeavor. Um, and then my final question would be just the 80% AMI. That would be the only carve out in my understanding for an exemption. So if there was a, a development that had some units that were meeting that requirement or the units in totality, I wanted to make sure that that was the only exemption that we see right now. And that's it for me. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Councillor Sherazai. Um, Ross, can you talk about the planning districts and then maybe um, Kurt can respond to the question about the where, um, where practical? Yeah, the, the seven planning districts uh, shown up on the screen here came out of Concept Lakewood, basically. And at the time we wrote the original ordinance, we put the, we wanted to keep the nexus close to where the money is collected, where we would spend the money in those particular areas. They don't follow the wards because ward boundaries do change with population changes. These were static planning districts where we collected money and we spent the funds in those particular districts. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, um, I think we determined that we wanted to eliminate these planning districts as well. We've we're going to recommend eliminating the planning districts as a part of the new ordinance. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. And I'll try to address the question um, regarding where practical. I think one of the things that we want to do is just take a lot of the mapping exercises that were completed during the Imagine Tomorrow plan. And what we want to do is take that information, identify where there's gaps in the system, Get a, a, a really identify where the park needs are within the city. And that's where we would um, be more diligent with park dedication. So those are the tools that the staff doesn't have right now is they don't have the mapping, they don't have those tools at their fingertips. So, the, so that when a development comes in, it's apparent to both parties of where the gaps are and where those requirements uh, need to be made in terms of park dedications. So in cases where it's not possible, those might be infill development, um, urban projects, multifamily projects, higher density 
In some cases, it just might not be practical or possible given the scale and size of the development proposed in that particular part of the city. Um, so our goal as a consultant team is to provide this, the, the staff with better tools and more transparency. We think the mapping exercises, which we haven't done yet, they'll, they're not gonna be anything new. Basically what we plan to do is just build upon the data that was developed during the Imagine Tomorrow plan and use those tools to make uh, to create greater transparency around where the gaps exist um, in the park system. And, that, and those are the tools that will help guide staff as they make those decisions. Great, and I don't, I hope to not come back to me, Mayor, because I'd like us just to go one round. So I just would say that I want, uh, I loved the alternative park piece. I think I'm so in favor of that, particularly in the, the north side of Lake. We don't need to do another study to know where we need open space. I can already tell you where it is. And I also recognize that there's not a lot of land there. So any nook and cranny that we can creatively activate for like, uh, increased quality of life, I'm, I'm super in favor of. And that's it for me. Thank you. Councilor Stewart. Yeah, thank you so much for putting this together. I'm excited that there will be more opportunities for public engagement on this. I think that's something that our community has really been wanting. So I hope everybody takes note that there will be an opportunity to engage in this before it comes before council. And um, I'm really, really grateful for the feedback of folks in the community already who have commented on this plan. Um, I do also want to echo that I really like the idea of that um, compact and alternative park um those ideas you know to have easements and um you know public l land and spaces that are maintained by the development but that are open to the public i think is um, a really great option especially for infill communities where you know a, a full a land dedication might not be possible in the spirit of uh, something that Councillor Sharazai said actually in our previous conversation, I think some of the frustration in the community lies around not understanding when different um, mechanisms and tools get triggered. And so I would just really encourage us to try and map out, and I know that discretion is always needed at a certain point in time because not every development falls into a beautiful, perfect bucket every time. But I think to the extent that we can create transparency in this process around when a fee and lieu is collected, when a full parkland dedication is required, when a compact park development or a community space is required um, to the extent that we can standardize that and take the discretion out of it as much as possible, recognizing that some discretion will always be needed. Um, I would really encourage us to do that because, you know, I think I also want to just reiterate to the public that Lakewood is an infill city. We are more than 25% parks and open space now at this point in time. There are very specific parts of town, as you can see in this packet, that have a much greater need for parks and open space and green space and tree canopy than other parts of town. And I would really encourage as we're getting rid of these zones potentially, that we can also use Fee and Lou to really um, direct money and investment towards areas of town, regardless of where the development occurs, towards the areas of town that have deep inequities in access to parks and open space. I would love for that to be a part of the discussion and, you know, making sure that we all know that these types of fees and lose get pulled together to buy larger tracts of land, like Two Creeks Park, and that there is a, a place for all of these different tools. And if we can just be a little bit more clear and transparent about how we get to the decisions that we're making and have just the steps laid out so that everyone is clear, I think that would go a long way. Mayor Strom, 
can I can I respond to something Councillor Stewart said? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention because it's it's very important that there has to be a nexus between the development and where the fees are used. So to because this is something that we've we've struggled with when there's a development that occurs in the southern part of the city, just broad example, um, we couldn't take those fees and use them in the northern or eastern part of the city because le it's legally there's no connection between those the development and the the added parkland so that's the reason why we want to try to use these maps that will show areas where we need parkland for developers to understand that when they go into certain areas of the city we're gonna we're gonna require some level of parkland and we're gonna work with them to make that work within that particular area where we have a gap does that make sense yeah, that's helpful clarification. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Even if I don't love it, it makes sense. <laughs> Councillor Lebeer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I think for one thing for me, I see a lot of frustration, and this is something we certainly talked about when we redid this in 2018, which is the fair market value issue uh i i personally if we can get to a sort of a transparent clear fee number i frankly think that's probably better because it leaves out the you know the ambiguity and the frustration where people feel like oh well maybe we're not assessing it right or we're using the the wrong assessment tool or something like that um so that's one thing i would say is i think if we could get to just a fee um that probably it's probably easier on everybody but you know, I could certainly be persuaded, I guess, yeah, either way. But um, and then I think something to think about, too, is an appeals process whenever people feel like, uh, you know, things weren't done correctly. I know we have that for our school land dedication fee. I'm not sure what the implications of having that would look like in terms of, you know, volume or or, you know, I, I suspect not everybody would be using that tool, but who knows? Um, but I think that's something we should be thinking about. Um, annual review, I think, uh, especially if we have a fee and it's not just fair market value, right? We might have to do an annual review just to kind of make sure the fee is keeping pace with property values or, or something like that. Um, so I'd certainly be in support of, you know, taking a look at it more frequently. I don't necessarily have a set number of when I think that would be, but um, obviously in the past, we somehow came up with five years. <laughs> I think it's just because uh, I think before that it hadn't changed in 30 years or something, so or, or maybe 40. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I think so. We were thinking, okay, well, at least every five, maybe that's uh, a, a good opportunity to, to take another look at it. Um, the planning districts, I kind of like the planning districts because there's that transparency thing where you know it's kind of going to be in some specific area. Um, the funds and you know there is concern and i will say there always is concern because right who's going to be paying most of these fees it's going to be where they're building the most and where are they building the most they're building in ward one and ward two um so there's always concern about oh well you know these people are building the most in our community and we're not getting the money in our community so obviously um sometimes having some transparency like a, a district or something um you know is nice um so if there's a way to do that differently, that is transparent and also speaks more of the equity factor, I, I think maybe that could work. But um, I do like, obviously, uh, it's not super publicized, these planning districts, but <laughs> perhaps uh, perhaps it could be or, you know, I don't know. But I just want to comment on that. And I think uh, one other thing I'll just bring up, I, I'm interested in increasing potentially the, the fee, but I also worry about going the other direction on affordability. Because and this is a conversation we had a lot years ago. This will certainly have an impact if a developer has to pay a million dollars extra on on a project. Um, can certainly have a an impact on what people's rent uh, might look like. So that's something to think about. And then that, that's another reason we created density factors, because it was kind of unfair that, that we were essentially encouraging uh people at one point to build um sort of single family or like 
you know, track homes uh, were more desirable, even though they took up a lot more land um, than maybe like a higher density uh, development. So that's one reason we put in density factors. Um, and I will leave my comments that, but I just thought I'd share. So thanks. Councilor Mia Guerrero. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to ask the same question. I promise that's my pause. <laughs> um, I definitely want to echo the small park notion. I also, if if this proves to just be like too complicated of a, of a thing to think about in order for us to be able to move forward, I, I it is okay. But I know that there have been some other not green space, but there's been some other um, types of programming where we encourage developers to like essentially try to make deals with each other. Um, and so I wonder if there's any possibility of, right, we know that a postage stamp park is harder to maintain. Can we in some way encourage, like if you dedicate parkland that touches parkland? Um, I think that, you know, we don't need it to be expansive, but particularly I live next to uh, an empty lot. It's a half acre. It would be a beautiful tiny park, but it's also next door to a tiny park. And then that would be a mid-sized park, which would be cheaper to maintain per foot. So um, again, if it's fee and loo, the city gets more control over that. But I really am hearing and I'm seeing in this and how I feel is that I'm really hoping that we structure this in a way that encourages less buyouts and more land dedication. Um, you know, that, that that threshold is is a burden enough that developers are really trying to work on creating green space for us. So that's a question. I don't know if you have like thoughts on it. I saw you nodding your head. Um, I, I know that that's like a strange one. Oh, well, you mentioned some things that, that do ring true. Um, small park parcels if we can get them adjacent so the parcel that you're talking about if we can get them the, a parcel that's adjacent to an already existing park that's helpful we want to try to make sure that these small parks are taken care of maintained by um the developer or the property manager or another entity rather than the city um because it is more expensive even though per acre if it's you're just talking staff costs those are similar park to park, one acre park versus a 12 acre park. But when you add in the the time that it takes to load and un unload equipment and the time that, that's extra time that you're paying staff loading, unloading and doing the work that they have to do at small parks and then traveling fuel costs are added on to that and you end up having it's more expensive for the city. So it's a really it's a staff capacity issue for us. So I, I don't know if that completely addresses a couple of things that you mentioned, Councillor. Very helpful. I do I do think even if it was a very minimal amount of you can dedicate a, like a 5% less or, you know, something that's pretty small where you're not going to feel an mm -hmm. impact really standing on the acre, um, but where the it makes it easier for them to say by like a single, like what would be a single home lot, but it touches Yes. It's empty and it touches up, right? I, so if there's something small like that, I just I'm interested in that innovation. I also I also had a question about um, about this idea of maintenance and in terms of the fee structure, having the fee structure like reflect some of that cost if they're not who are maintaining it. I think that the idea of, mm. of getting of uh, the developer or the, the private company, the owner, et cetera, whoever it is, to maintain is a great idea. Um, I go to a dog park that's maintained that way and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but I also get somewhat nervous with just our ability to enforce code if somebody's maybe not being as responsible in their maintenance and, um, you know, even things like private security versus Lakewood police, which has more public oversight than private security for people who are on that parkland. So things like that make me just a touch. It wouldn't make me oppose it, but it does make me think, are there ways to build in that into the fee structure? Um, and of course, the general idea of making the, the fee, what we can spend it on 
more flexible so that that is possible in general, right? Which I know is reflected, but I just want to really highlight that that is very important to me, which is another component of that. I don't know if we've done legal analysis on this, but my current understanding of how a fee and then a fund works, I really think that connectivity to parks, so connectivity between parks, being able to walk from a school to a park, being able to ride a bike from a transit spot or a major traffic hub to a park on safe, maintained sidewalks and bike lanes that are well lit and have tree canopies, I would firmly argue are well within that like fee definition um, and not within the like tax definition that that is narrow enough to the purpose of the fee. Um, and so really, especially again, in word two, we end up with this thing where we have a lot of the small parks, right? We have many and, and, and they're growing and we're really pleased that that's working out. But especially with this flexibility, we'll see an increase in those small parks, which I think is wonderful. But you really, there, it is pretty dangerous right now to walk park to park. Um, and so having both the district that is having the highest rate of density and then, you know, based on this equity map, and if that's then some of how we guide where our park investment happens, we'll also see an uptick in our parkland. So we'll have more people, more kids, and more places for those kids and families to go, um, and no way, no way for them to get to them, even though they're only a couple blocks away. Um, and so that conflict with traffic does worry me in Ward 2, and I, I really think that it should be a part of the like definition of what the city is allowed to spend it if it is a fee in lieu. Great feedback, thank you. Councilor Sink. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot here, isn't there? <laughs> um, I like Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Sherazai's thought about annualizing this. This can help a lot, especially as the market valuation of the land might change from year to year. And then um, speaking of that, uh, public comment said, of course, throughout the city, the market valuation of the land changes. And um, and then I also read, but or if you could explain to me, so it seems like I read that it was, it's hard to have a standard, to have it fluctuate and that we want that what is it, 432,000, we, we want that standard fee throughout the city. So could you explain why it would be so difficult to have different fees in lieu reflect different land values throughout the city? Russ, do you want to respond to that? Give it a try. It's very difficult to come up with land values. Um, by project by project and timing and how the go, those go through our development process where we're trying to determine the fees right up front when they're coming in the door or if we're taking land right up front when you're coming in the door we don't want to wait until the end of the day when they are applying for a building permit and that's not the time to try and get land education uh and yes parcels of land vary from place to place, locate, you hear from your every real estate agent out there, location, location, location is um, three acres on Wadsworth, uh, good example, three acres on Wadsworth uh, or an acre and a half parcel that we acquired a couple of years ago on Wadsworth was, and one on Kipling along Bear Creek. The difference in price was about 25%. The one on Wadsworth was significantly higher. The one on Kipling was not because it was in a residential area and a lower value in there. So it's very difficult to come up with a set uh, appraised value for every single logic out there. The other issue that we have found in trying to come up with appraisals or come up with values of land, this county assessor's records are not as reliable as we'd like them to be to come up with true value, but they also their their values also includes buildings which we're looking at raw land out there. Um, and that's, and, and we're trying to make something easy for us to administer, easy for us to update in a, in a manner that's uh, fair to everyone that's uh, going through the process. And um, we're, it, 
And sometimes we've taken, we've gone for uh, appraisals and it's taken us three months to get, three to four months to get an appraisal done on parcels that we've looked at, which is uh, very difficult for anyone looking at developing a property, especially single family person that is dividing their one lot into two lots. Uh, it becomes a, a fairly large burden on those type of developers. So we're trying to find a, a equitable, simple method to update and we'll do it more regularly. I want to point out, that, as Mr. LeBeer uh, mentioned, when we originally wrote the ordinance, the city council put a cap on the amount of fee we could charge per unit. Based, basically, it was $700, and that lasted until 2018 when we, the authorization was changed to change that fee. But $700 equated out to $50,000 an acre of value of land in the city of Lakewood. We haven't seen that land value in the city of Lakewood since the early 1990s at the, at the latest out there. Hopefully that explains where we are on coming up with market value uh, values for the land that we're acquiring. Councillor Sinks, additionally, we want to make sure that the developers have an understanding when from the get go, rather than because we can chase, you know, people away who want to build residential units if we are not clear about what the fee would be from the beginning. Great, thank you. And so one last question is to just check my understanding. So it seems like there's three options then they can um, dedicate land, they can dedicate land and, or they can pay fee in lieu, or according to the Norris design document, the third one would be a compact park development. And, and I like that idea, you know, again, um, to, as I believe um, Councillor Myatt Guerrero said, yeah, these smaller parks, yeah, that's a, a great option. I live pretty close to Cottage Park, which is less than an acre. And so um, do I understand it correctly that all compact parks would be under the management of an HOA or a developer, in other words, not the city? Is, is that a correct understanding? from your document here? That's the recommendation that we're making. Um, let okay. me try to clarify something earlier that you said earlier, which is uh, these are not choices that the developer gets to make. And that's been a, a pretty broad misunderstanding in the community. So this is a good opportunity to explain. This, these are choices that we get, we would be making as staff in working with the developer know, and knowing what it is that the community of the area where the development is happening, what the need is there. So it's not, it's not a choice that they get to make. That, that's one thing. And then the cottage park that Kurt mentioned is just one of the options that, that might be sort of, we could discuss with them. Here's an idea. You could do a you could do this park or you could do a dog park or a community garden. Here's some different <laughs> options that might work for the land that you have. And then, yes, we would hope that anything less than three acres would be, our goal would be to have those newer, smaller properties taken over, the maintenance taken over by by another organization. We would own the property and make a, do a, um, or do a memorandum or a IGA with them, if you will, that's not the right term, but a contract with them mm -hmm. to agree that they would be responsible for maintenance. But if anything did go wrong, the city that way would have the opportunity to take the land back and figure out how to manage it differently if need be. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. All right, then we have Councillor Cruz, Councillor Ryan, and then Councillor Nystrom. Thank you all, and, and thanks again for this great presentation. I think uh, as is demonstrated by this um, conversation, this is of importance to a lot of us in the community, so thank you. Um, I think my first question, just wanted to put a finer point on something um, Councillor Mayotte Guerrero was bringing up about like how these funds can be used. So just for my understanding, can the funds currently be used um, through this fee and lieu um, for like maintenance and for improvements to connectivity to parks or that need to be updated through this process? The, the funds can be used for improvements but not for operational costs, such as maintenance costs. Maintenance costs. Okay, 
So that would need to be, if that was something we were interested in, which maybe I'm signaling, um, is that something that would be then needed in this update process to be discussed? Ma- you mean maintenance costs? Yes. That would be something that you would probably want to talk about in the budget process. If, if, if we need to increase operational costs, that generally is going to mean additional staff. Right. And so my, my question really is how can we make that come from this pot of funds if desired? Uh, the, the, we, I don't think that's possible legally. The, the funds that come from the parkland dedication fee in lieu can only be used for park improvements or park acquisitions, new park acquisitions. Okay. I would maybe like to talk a little bit more about that offline because to okay. me, you know, improvements and acquisitions require maintenance. And I think that if that will take an update or whatever, that's something that I'm interested in because frankly, I think that that's a, of huge interest to folks in Ward 2 specifically, but I think throughout the community rather than just acquisitions. Um, so then my next question um uh, relates to the districts piece. So I heard you all say, you know, that part of the proposal is to eliminate the districts, but then also that the money has to be spent close to where the development is happening. And so I pre- I really like this equity mapping idea. I'm excited about that, but just want to better understand how these two competing considerations are going to be kind of melded together through this process. The idea is that we identify where the gaps are with by using the equity map. And whenever there's a development that's in one of those gap areas, we would work with a developer to ensure that there's a way that they can get public park space as a part of the development. But there's not a way that we can create a nexus between a park, you know, a green belt park property as an example, and a, a park addition or an improvement up, up in the north part of the city. It's a legal it's a legal issue that there has to be a nexus between the development and what gets added. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so just so that I understand, the it, I, I get that like this equity map will help kind of uh, inform the decisions around the dedication versus the fee, and, and I think that that's a great idea. I, but with the elimination of these districts, how will the determination about the distance or proximity to a development be made. Oh, I follow you. Okay. Um, Kurt, do you think maybe you could respond to that question? Yeah, I mean, the mapping exercise is going to help identify the gaps. That's where we want to start. And so I think uh, first and foremost, again, as Kit mentioned, these are going to be tools for staff to use with regards to how dedications work. And so uh, what we wanna do is make all of this information more easily understood, more easily available, so that the staff and the development community have kind of what's missing right now. The districts don't provide a lot of benefit to that in that regard. Uh, They don't really speak to adjacency to parks. They don't speak to how close I am to a park. Um, They're more random districts. And so I think that's why we're moving away from them or suggesting that we perhaps move away from them is because they don't really facilitate what we're trying to accomplish, which is equal access to park spaces. Okay. I think that makes more sense. I really appreciate that elaboration. Um, And then I guess the final maybe question or point, I know we got a public comment from kind of a coalition of affordable housing developers regarding making some of this Um, parkland dedication kind of exemption for affordable housing more predictable for them. Um, And so kind of just curious what the kind of implementability of that type of a recommendation looks like from y'all's end. Um, And also just from my end, like, is 80 the right threshold of that? Or do we want to think if there's an automatic exemption for that to be more deeply affordable, like 60% AMI or something like that? Yeah, this came up when we did our last um, ordinance rewrite as well. I think we're open to suggestions and we can rely on the consultants to help us a little further dig into that, make sure that we have the right the right um, number. Yeah. Great. Thanks. 
You bet. And I'll just um, conclude my comments. I know I'm right at my five minutes <laughs> um, by saying I just want to echo what folks are saying about pocket parks and, and really trying to think about how we can maybe incentivize. And, and I think that a lot of the plan does that. And I'm looking forward to continuing along that line because I think that that's really important to people in our area and across the city. <laughs> I'm excited about a lot of the other recommendations regarding in fee, increasing the fee in lieu as soon as possible, annualizing that and making it as predictable as possible. Um, and a lot of the other great recommendations you worked hard on. So thank you. And I just want to speak once a little bit to the affordable the housing units. Current ordinance does allow for the 80% AMI uh, reduction. However, it requires the developer to go before city council. And that's where I think is probably the biggest mm. stumbling block in their decision no. process there. That uh, the director may recommend it, but it has to go before city council. And that's, that no one has taken us up on that offer for the last five years. Thank you. Councilor Ryan. Hi, thank you. This is uh, very helpful. I'm, I'm, uh, I wanted to start with the 432,000 adjusted number. It's my understanding you don't need our approval, right? Under the existing 14.16.070, you can just make that change now. You don't need our yes, approval, correct. Correct. correct? Okay, great. And is there any reason to delay putting that into effect uh, absent the city council uh, requesting a different number? No, we can we, we just give warning. I think we want to allow for 30 days for the community to understand that there's been a change. But other than that, no, unless other some of you all have objections or want to give us different opinions, we can move forward with that. Yes. And, and is that number you know, we keep talking about fair market value? Is that the fair market value of generalized residential property or are we trying to come up with a fair market value of what we consider parkland? Well, well, we used um, appraisal values that we've gotten on properties over the last five years and came up with the, everything from A to Z, as you can imagine. And we just took an average of those numbers. And it's not, it varies, as Ross said, it can vary from, you know, really, really high per acre cost to very low, depending on where. So we just landed on that as a happy medium, if you will. Okay, so it's an effort to try and come up with a fair market value yeah. of residential property across the city. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and the data that you used is over the last five years? Is that... Yes, okay. correct. And, it, you know, I, I noticed under our existing ordinance right now, the, uh, the director has discretion if it's, uh, does not have discretion if we're talking about 15 acres or more. Um, and I'd want to just double check our conversations with Metro West, but it's my understanding if we went to something smaller, say nine acres and 150 units, so one or the other, if if the if a development included nine acres or included 150 acres or more, um, we'd say that the uh, default, if you will, is a parkland dedication. Um, and we could have a mechanism in which uh, that there could be uh, a way to take that out. I've been taught by several department heads that we should not give too much discretion. Uh, you want more objectivity. Is that uh, something that you could work with? You know, I'm the numbers. You know, we can play with a little bit. But if we went something smaller than 15 acres, and we also tied it to a number of units as opposed to just a landmass. Uh, as you mentioned, we're an infill city, so we don't have great swaths of raw land. Is that something you could look at? Uh, we could certainly take a look at it. I don't want to answer at this point because I, I think we need to regroup and talk about that idea before I, we respond. But yeah. No, absolutely. I just yeah. love for uh, just the staff to take a look at that. And obviously with that, all of that would be a caveat would be um, anything that any units that are eighty percent, or if there's a different number that City Council wants to put on the AMI, um, that would be accepted or exempted from um, from from the parkland dedication as well. I would be in favor yes. of it um, not having to go to City Council if we have units that are eighty percent, um, but we may need to talk about that because if we're just talking about one or two units. Uh, as opposed to like a Metro West where the entire property 
is, is more uh, geared towards low income, then I, I think that's something we would need to take a look at. Um, and just in terms of this broader discussion about what the acreage would be, um, you know, in real estate, there's a, a common term of what is the larger parcel, right? So an owner may have, we may have two different parcels, but they're connected in terms of title they're, you know, or use or contiguity. Um, those would be considered the larger parcel. And I think we should be capturing that in, in our discussions as well. Um, I love that your multifamily uh, density went went up. I, I appreciate that. I think there's some places in the ordinance uh, where I think if we do this uh, exception for AMI and uh, number of acres and a number of units, we may need to start it out or uh, you know subject to uh, say for example section 14.16.040a um, uh, for that. To, to make it clear that you have discretion subject to those types of things. Um, I would like to see the annualized review. Uh, and I think, it, I think I would like that to not be discretionary that I, that this uh, 432,000 number would be assessed uh, annually or mm -hmm. reviewed annually to update that. And I do think it would be a good idea uh, right now under the, uh, 0.100. We have that five-year review. I'd like some stronger language for, for the, to, to get a report back as to how this is going to see whether we're having some unintended consequences before five years come up. Uh, and then my other question is uh, more for Norris. Could you, uh, could you share the, what cities you looked at? You, you mentioned you were trying to come up with some different thoughts as to how we deal with an infill city. I'd like to know what other infill cities perhaps you might've looked at, or if you could share some of that raw data uh, with us in a, in a separate email. Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, a number of cities that we researched and I'm going to ask Elise Applegate uh, from the Norris team to, to hop on and, and respond to that if she's available. She may have had to, to jump off, but we're happy to provide that for you. Uh, we did uh, extensive research, looked at many, many different communities. There she is. Elise, would you uh, be able to just to provide a quick uh, update on the number of uh, communities that we researched? Yes, absolutely. We started out with about two dozen cities that matched Lakewood in terms of um, the population, you know, 100 to 150,000 people, um, proximity to a major metropolitan area, and um, sort of a limited ability to continue to grow, um, whether that be through artificial growth boundaries or um, just because there are cities or, or mountains in every other direction. Um, and then kind of narrowed that down into a smaller group that we really focused on for this report um, or recommendations. Um, we focused on in the Denver metro area, both Westminster and Aurora. I know those are not exact examples, but there are some good similarities. Um, we also looked at Fort Collins and Greeley, not so much for their um, you know, outward growth, but for the way that they have been dealing with um, some very similar challenges as, as um, cities have changed. And we can touch a little more on Fort Collins. We have some expertise there. Um, and then we also looked at several areas in Southern California, kind of the Los Angeles area, um, Santa Ana, Santa Clara, um, that had some pretty similar situations. Um, all of our comparisons were in the Western part of the U.S. because land patterns here are so different from the eastern part of the U.S. that was developed earlier. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if it's possible to share that raw data, that would be very helpful. I'd love to be able to look at some of those ordinances to just get a sense of, as to what some of the others are doing. And then uh, hopefully this is my last question, but one of the things that sounds fairly exciting, but uh, as some of the um, public comments mentioned, I'm not sure how it's going to work. So I understand that the city doesn't want to maintain something that's less than three acres, a dedication that'd be less than three acres. And I understand that. Um, and, and so we're relying on the idea that a developer might come up with their own smaller pocket park, if you will, that's under three acres. And I just wonder how likely that would be if if the fair market value, frankly, is 
lower than what they're probably paying for or what they paid for or what the value of the property that they're holding now is? Why would they dedicate property that they hold that has a fair market value higher than what the assessed value would be? So do we really see that a pocket park would actually happen? Um, Ross, do you want to respond to that one? We don't, we're not sure it's in the pocket park. It's, it's enough incentive for there to do it. We may, we may need to look at how our ordinance is structured to encourage that type of development in there. Um, it, our biggest problem, we've tried that using the existing ordinance, giving credit for extra uh, open space beyond what is required by their zoning in there. And unfortunately, what we've we didn't have a process in tracking that or making sure that it was stayed public in there. And what I'm seeing now is, well, down in the Mission Trace area, down in the Pioneer Park, south end of the city, uh, we're seeing develop the apartment complexes where, or townhome complexes where they had amenities that they put in there, like swimming pools and tennis courts. And now taking out those amenities and adding more apartment units on top of those, uh, or at least requesting that. I, they, but we've had those requests come in just recently out there. So we do need to find a process to encourage keeping open space within the within the development or within the site, as long as it's beyond what is minimally required by our zoning limits. Could could we require a developer in their you know submitted plat to have a pocket park in there and maintain it? Is that something that we would have the ability to do under Nolan Dolan? We do have some, uh, in the cases in the Rooney Valley where we have pushed for that type of, and they have taken that on, we're not getting a lot of subdivision plats per se. We're getting townhome, you know, one lots being subdivided into six townhomes. And that doesn't generate uh, a lot of space, or that, and it doesn't generate a, a planning process a lot of times, too, unfortunately. And, and I apologize for, for my words in using uh, plat. Can, can does the city legally have the ability to require a developer to have a pocket park, for example, um, instead of dedicating a parkland to the city or a fee in lieu? I think we'll have to look into a little more research into that particular process or specific specificity uh, on that because uh, I have not found. Um, in my recollection, I have not seen that occur. Maybe we'll work with our consultants and see if they've had some experience in that area. Great. So, thank you. And just last comment, I, I, I appreciate getting rid of the district maps. Um, I think uh, they're fairly arbitrarily, I mean, they're probably made a lot of sense when they were drawn up. Um, but I think if we're trying to do something that we would just say the land, uh, the dedication has to be somewhere in the vicinity. Um, then we're not bound by the the map. I think it could be give you a lot more flexibility to, for equity purposes. All right, Councilor Nystrom. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, uh, and I uh, appreciate all the information that was provided. Um, it's very helpful. I, uh, I am encouraged to hear about the listening sessions um, that will be happening or the, the, the public interaction that will be happening in the month of May. Um, I think that's really going to be helpful to help people understand what, um, what may change. And I'd like to understand a little bit more about the legal nexus uh, that was referred to before. Um, I think my co-counselors have made a lot of really good comments. I guess, you know, the I'm very pleased to hear that we're reimagining what a park um, is considered because I I kind of think the uh, equity map, as it's called, uh, might look a little bit different if um, when we were building apartment complexes and things of that nature that we were including some park space. So the park space can be very simple and low maintenance, um, zero escaping, a walking path, those types of things. And I, and I think that should be a priority. Um, 
you know, especially when, when we're building high density housing, um, you know, the, from my viewpoint, parks, trees, birds and bees, they're not a luxury, they're a necessity and they shouldn't be, you know, just viewed as a transaction. Um, and I think we need to take some discretion out of this process um, because I think the best interests of the citizens come from input from citizens and then utilizing the tools we already have to make some of these decisions. And we have a planning commission that is there to advise council on some of these things. Um, and, and I think that, you know, small spaces, small parks um, can make a world of difference for the quality of life of residents. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, the, the Northeastern part of the city, you know, again, if we revisit how we're approaching developments, um, instead of the default, the default in my mind should be the park land versus the fee um, because a developer is going to opt out every time. And I think historically looking at the documentation that was provided, that's what's been happening. Um, and that, you know, that has, um, again, raised a lot of concern. It's not helping us meet our tree canopy goal. Um, and, and once you build something, that land is gone. You're not gonna replace it. Or once you cut down trees, they are gone. You can put seedlings in somewhere else, but it's gonna take 25 years till you actually get canopy out of it. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think, um, there's a lot of good questions that have been asked and I'm interested in uh, finding, getting a little more information on some of these things. And, um, you know, and, and again, with the, you know, so you, you mentioned um, subdivisions or apartments or whatever, where people are removing park space to put in swimming pools that is something that really should be factored into ordinances to avoid that possibility going forward. Um, and I too would love to see the raw data on the analysis that's been done so far. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here to not only look at what, what the fee in lieu is, but the process that we're going through and whether it makes sense um, in terms of representing the citizens. So I look forward to, you know, the further engagement and the community feedback. Thank you. Councillor Lowe. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, uh, Ms. Newland, I, could, could you confirm something for me? I, I, this may be an elementary question, but I wanna make sure I'm understanding it right. Right now, and, and also under your proposal, like a core thing that Fee and Lou can go to is 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 the city acquiring new parkland, right? I mean, so once in in the districts, but if there's a plot of land with enough Fee and Lou dollars, we can go out and acquire a park and 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 create and build a new citywide park, right? I mean, that's a fundamental thing yes. that we, we use these dollars for, right? Yes, yes. Two Creeks Park is an example. Okay. Um, and just one other clarifying question: this. Uh, this proposal that you're bringing for us has been, um, I assume, uh, co-developed in, in consultation with the planning department too, because because it does seem like it has a lot of planning implications. Yes, we've been they they were part of our uh, our stakeholder group. Yes. And do they? I mean, does plan if Travis isn't on the call, but does he support this recommendation? Um, the last conversation I had with Travis, honestly, he was thinking that we should get rid of the parkland dedication and just take fees. So uh, I guess, no, <laughs> he doesn't necessarily support it, but we're pretty far along in the process. And we believe really strongly that we need to keep a parkland dedication. So that's how we've landed. I, I want us to take a step back here. I, I, I think I really appreciate this. This is a tough issue. Yeah. Um, I think Councillor Ryan hit on something really, really fundamentally important here, which is he made the point, okay, so we're doubling Fian Lu, and I, I get that. But yeah, mo most developers are probably, if given if it's still below market rate, like just the, on the pure economics, they're going to default to um to, to Fian Lu where possible. I understand it's something that that 
that um, community resource approves. It's not of the developer, but but I I do think I mean the point's been made many times at this point that um, there, there's a pretty consistent record over the last five years of fee and lieu instead of these you know parkland dedications, and I think for economic reasons. Look, I want more parks. I mean, for all the reasons we've talked about, um, Lakewood has a lot of parks. We have a lot of open space, and particularly in the areas we've talked about, which you know primarily we've talked about in the north, but there are some important parts on the eastern side of Ward 3. There are parts we need more open space. And let me say something that may be a little bit quickly unpopular, but it's really important. This has got to be balanced with this question of strategic density, okay? Um, in communities like Lakewood, if they want to be strong towns, and we want to be strong towns, they need more strategic density. It's how you get walkable neighborhoods and bikeable neighborhoods. It's how you get tax revenue that's going to build a strong community, right? Um, it's and it's also a critical part of, of an affordable housing strategy. Anyone that thinks that we can we can deal with the affordable housing crisis we're in just by building more townhomes and single family homes doesn't is is not looking at the data correctly. I'm a little worried that by doubling fee and lieu in if we do it with it without being really strategic about our larger affordable housing goals and our larger sort of planning conversation, that's frankly part of why I asked about Director Parker. I'm worried what we're doing is we're adding an important barrier for 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 building, frankly, yes, I mean, apartment complexes, I'll say it. Um, and, you know, condo homes. Right. Um, and I do want more parks. But if we get way more de denser developments, we're not going to get fee and lieu revenue. Right. Um, which will cut off an important funding source for new parks. I think what we, our goal here should be to create a structure where, yes, we do have, I, I'm for increasing fee and lieu um, so that it's closer to market rate. But I just, I also think it needs to be done in coordination with some other things that will create incentives for developers to put in place uh, denser projects that will then allow us to couple those things with going out and acquiring strategic parks that actually work. And yes, to Councillor Nystrom's point, I also think that that if we can require, you know, if someone's going to build a big complex, I think if we can make sure that they're carving out pocket parks, I'm all for that and not giving them a way out of that. But we've got to make sure that we're not creating barriers to affordable housing and walkable neighborhoods and making our communities stronger with, with you know, the, the, the tax revenue that that will bring, right? Those things have to be balanced. Um, so that's all to say. I, I like this proposal. I think it makes sense. Um, but I really would like to see it done. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very mindful that, that this has major planning developments. And I think it does need to be considered in, in context with um, with Council's affordable housing goals. Um, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is, I think if Director Parker would hear, were here, he would talk and he'd be right to, that, that it's great that we have this affordable housing carve out, but very, very few developers are actually taking advantage of it. And raising the, the fee and lieu might create an incentive to do that. So I like that, but I'm not sure it's strong enough to start having developers suddenly start churning out, you know, 80% or 60% to Councilor Cruz's yeah. um, affordable housing set aside. So these things have to be done. These things don't work in isolation. Um, I, I'd i like to see, you know, a, a policy that, that requires developers to set aside some pocket parks, but maybe with a little bit more flexibility than what we currently have. Um, and if we're going to raise fee and lieu, I, I guess I'd love to see some data to make sure that we're not going to like cut off both an important funding source for park maintenance and park acquisition, and we're not going to throttle Lakewood's ability to create more walkable neighborhoods. And I'll stop. Um, thanks. Thanks again for the presentation. Director Newland, did you want to respond to any of that before I move on? No, I don't think so. It's all all of great feedback, and okay. we're just kind of absorbing a lot of the feedback. It, it sounds like, okay. I guess maybe I would ask you, um, it sounds like maybe another session with City Council prior to an ordinance. Um, the ordinance being read in might be helpful because maybe we need to have another opportunity to get specific feedback from all of you, I think. Because we're hearing a lot of different thoughts and ideas, so I'm seeing some heads nod. Maybe we could schedule another study session. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Let's. Um. We've got three more speakers okay. here. Let's go through everybody. Um. And then 
see how we might chart our course going forward. Sounds good. Councilor Over. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to start um, with this uh, equity map. And uh, this question's for anybody who wants to answer it. I'm looking at uh, 26th Avenue. Um, and this map is showing that there's a pretty high, high need for parks there. Uh, why isn't Crown Hill Park considered when this map was made? Because it's right across the street and it's a huge park. And there's no way I would consider that they need more parks right along 26. Amber, Amber, do you know the answer to that? Yes, there was a lot of back and forth about that, Councillor Over, with our master plan consultant for Imagine Tomorrow. And um, where the advisor committee landed was that um, Crown Hill not being in the city of Lakewood, they didn't want to include it in the map. But I do see your point. Thank you. Because it's an obvious point. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's wrong. This map is just wrong um, because of that. Um, and also, I heard a couple, still sticking to that map, uh, I've heard a number of times that we have over 20% of our land area is parks. Does that include um, Bear Creek Lake Park? Yes. Okay, because that's federal land. So yes. if we're not going to include Crown Hill because it's in Wheat Ridge, then we shouldn't be including federal land in that one too. Well, we, we we do operate Bear Creek Lake Park as opposed to Crown Hill. We do not we, operate Crown Hill. That's a good question. Did we contribute, did Lakewood contribute to the, uh, to making Crown Hill Park or buying the land? Or do we contribute maintenance costs to it right now? Because I, if I were Wheat Ridge, I would be asking Lakewood for money because we're, our citizens are sitting right there and are using it all the time. I'll guarantee that. We do contribute to maintenance there. It's a three-way partnership, but we contribute to a small portion to maintenance, yes. Okay. So I think I made my point. Um, okay. So also earlier, uh, Ross said that uh, in most cases, they took the fee over parkland. I think it's all cases. Is that correct? In the last since since the law was changed in 2018, we've never taken parkland dedication, have we? Or parkland, we've always taken fee and loose since the the law changed or the ordinance changed in 2018. Is that correct, Ross? Have we taken any land? I can't remember the answer to that question. We have not had an opportunity to finish several projects that we've requested requested land. We do have several projects out there that are still in the development uh, process that we have requested land uh, to be dedicated. And we have taken land dedication in the forms of easements for trails and some improvements, um, those developments. As far as have, have we officially taken possession of them at this point in time, I would have to go back and look through our, our list of development it's in the last five years to do that. We've requested, right. we've requested some, it's it's very tough to find some locations that fit that but we do have i i, I know we've picked, picked up several small parcels could you tell us off, do you know off the top of your head uh what which ones we're looking at um for taking land because there's a difference between saying we've never done it and yeah we have done it or we we're almost going to do it well, we are we are working on several up in the uh, Ward Two area that right now that we are requiring land dedication for uh, for trail systems and adjacent to our park uh, specific development. I I, mean, I have to put together a list of which ones we're working with right now. But uh, in fact, we uh, just had a recent. The problem that I'm having is we make these comments at a pre-planning stage and may take a year, may take only two weeks before they turn into a formal case. So uh, I have a lot of pre-planning cases where we said we want land, but do they become formal cases? No, in some instances, not every single one of them have become a formal case that we've completed and taken to fruition yet. Uh, but we are working on it. Um, the two creeks in the 
Keep Criteria off 13th Avenue. Uh, working with Metro West, we've had a trail system, in, not necessarily, in, but between Lamar and Harlem Street on Dry Gulch, uh, where we got land dedicated for trails. Um, we are working on 13th Avenue just to the east of Mount Air Park, trying to get a trail system, and we've taken parcels along from several developers right along the light rail line there. Um, but there are, those are some of the examples where we have gotten those developments. And then also looking at timing, I've been here too long. I think years have blurred together, unfortunately, as far as uh, which, which one, when they came in or when, where the, when we got them through the system. I think we've all been here too long, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, but uh, the, I'm confused. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, I got confused tonight with the nexus um, between developments and where the fees are used. Mm -hmm. And I think you tried to answer this once, but I'm still confused. Sorry. Um, okay. Can I can I have maybe to help? Um, we have Clancy Mullen. He's one of our consultants online. This sure. is probably an area that he can speak expertly to. Okay. But I was going to also refer oh, them to that slide about the two creeks because okay. earlier today, tonight, um, the slide for Two Creeks Park came up and it was talked about, oh, we're using all of our fee and lieu or fees. And, and so I'm not sure where those fees are coming from. Is, is it the fee and lieus? It's a different fee. So, yes, please. Yes, it's the fees and lieu that we're using our some fees and lieu that were collected in that planning district to help develop the park. OK, that makes sense. So it's not so it's not from it, the way it sounded earlier. It sounded like it was coming from the feeds and loose from all of Lakewood, but if it's oh, good, no. okay, never mind. Then then that clears that up completely. Okay. Um, all right. So my opinion is that yeah, we need to increase the fee and lieu, um, and I would set it with the with the um, value of the land. I would keep a separate price, and I'm sure uh, our uh, our staff can can handle that, even though it's a little tough. Um, and also, I don't love the idea of leaving this all up to the director of community services. I'd like I like council to have some authority at some point. Um, I've always been championing council authorities, <laughs> but uh, now um, do we want every one of them to come before us? No, we don't. But I could see a lot of them coming before us. And they just go right through and get passed on the consent agenda. But once in a great while, there's going to be one like Belmar Park that comes through and and we actually stand up and stand up for do our job for what we were elected for. And and because you know, we hear from all the people continuously. And so I'd rather this was all decided at council level and not director level. And uh, that's about all I have right now, but I would like to have more conversations about this. It's just late and everybody wants to quit right now. And so, yeah, uh, if you want another study session, I'm all for that. Do you, do you want to give, uh, Mayor Strom, do you want to give Clancy a chance to just briefly speak about the nexus that was asked about earlier and mm -hmm. Councillor Olver? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, well, you put me on the spot because I I don't have a great answer. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm not sure there is a. I mean, there's nothing in state law about the required nexus being a proximity thing. I mean, you have to spend uh, you have to spend the fees on something that's growth related, on something that adds to your your uh, park infrastructure. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, next door to the development that, you know, there, there's no hard and fast rule about uh, how close you have to be, how uh, proximity. So, you know, if you get rid of districts, then yes, I mean, that does kind of beg the question of what do you use to mm -hmm. say you're, you know, you're, you're in reasonable proximity. I mean, it becomes very difficult to. To pin that down, so mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would I would just kind of leave it there for right now. We could come back to it maybe. 
Okay, it sounds like something we need to get adv legal advice from our um, city attorney. Thank you, Clancy. Thank you. Councilor LeBeer. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Well, you know, I just wanted to point out that I think some of the frustrations in the community related to you know the park fee and loop situation, I think some of which actually could and, and should be addressed really in the zoning code not just the the fee and loop. I understand the issues with the fee and loop, but a lot of the frustrations is out of our MCU zoning district. And uh, uh, I know it's a little off topic, but I just want to point it out to the community that I think that's where a lot of their frustrations could be easily addressed. Because, you know, when I'm looking at the setbacks, for example, on the side and rear of an MCU zoning district, the minimum requirement is zero feet, you know, something a modest change, even a five foot or something like that, might actually help address some of these uh, community concerns. That I think have created some sort of consternation, uh, and particularly have sort of had people taking aim at the uh, the fee and loop. Um, also, I mean, just the open space requirement in the MCU is also fifteen percent. You know, that's something that might be we might want to uh, take a look at in a future uh, session. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. But I think that's there are there are appropriate places to help uh you know have these conversations about you know how we get more um appropriate development, you know. Uh so I just want to kind of mention that as well. Um and as far as a future session, I mean I a study session, I you know, it might be more helpful to do a, a work session. So I just want to kind of um throw that out there because obviously these things can be um can kind of easily get in the weeds and i'm not sure i'd have a whole lot more to add in a future conversation like this so i think i said my piece thanks okay thank you um where i'm landing i'm wondering so director Nolan, it sounds like we kind of we've got two steps that you're waiting to hear from us on First is number one, just approving an increase to the fee and lieu, which we're in a study session, so we're not necessarily voting on anything tonight, but you're you're looking for expeditious um, changes to the fee and lieu price just by itself, and then separately looking for council direction on moving forward on a deeper uh, addressing uh, you know different things that can be changed or improved within the fee and lieu and park dedication process that would include public engagement is that do i have that right we're kind of looking at two two answers for you tonight Yes, I, I have a suggestion. Maybe what we do, and I understand the concerns about the fee. Um, we can change the fee um, whenever. So um, I was thinking maybe we go ahead and move forward with this first fee change, the 432 or 437. Um, and then we can still get feedback from you going forward. And if the recommendation is that we do something different with that, then we can make another change to that. As far as the other um, input, I was just um, getting some information from our um, deputy city manager. He, he was suggesting maybe we do, we could provide you all, since we've heard all your feedback, we could provide you with options for some of these different discussion points. And then that might be a way to get through another conversation more expeditious, expeditiously. Yeah, well, and one of the things that the questions that I had with that second step was also, you know, it mentions in there a public engagement period. And I think, you know, we'd all be interested in, I mean, we can come back here and talk till we're blue in the face about questions and things that we'd like to see. But at the end of the day, our job is to represent the residents of Lakewood. And I'd like to personally, look at doing this public engagement part first mm -hmm. then we come back more informed on what our residents are asking for and i think that'll make a meteor um, conversation that'll have us hopefully landing um, more on what it is the community is ultimately looking for 
as we're trying to navigate forward. And, and some of that maybe comes out of comp plan conversations as well. I'm good with that. That sounds great. Okay. So um, first of all, council, I think I saw some consensus, almost anonymous, or not anonymous, what's the word <laughs> when everybody, <laughs> too late. Um, everybody, it looks like everybody was on board with the idea of increasing the fee now. Is there anyone that does not want to um, go ahead and increase the fee prior to that next step happening? Is there anyone that did not want to? Councilor Merritt Guerrero. I just have a, a question on that, which is, uh, is, If then we rework some of this, like over the coming months, year, whatever, if we go and rework um, like the affordable housing exemptions processes, et cetera, and like what threshold that is or what that looks like or why, we're still allowed to do that, right? Like increasing the fee now does not prevent us, like we don't then have to consent to another year or five years before we're able to like look at this. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just double checking. And yes, I feel fine about it. Perfect. Okay. So there's um, desire for that to occur. Then separately, does council, do we all have agreement that we would like to move forward with a public engagement period and then we circle back to go through some of these more specific ideas on how we improve the ordinance in general moving forward? Councilor Lowe, question? Just very, very quick thing on, on the on the first point of like, are we for increasing the fee in lieu, Mayor? Um, I mean, to, to Councilor Mayakura's point, sure. I, I guess you have to be very explicit about it. I, and I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Newland, I know how much is on your plate. But I, at some point, I would also love to just see a, some, a memo, a presentation, something from you and Director Parker that looks at, okay, fee in lieu has been increased. How does this fit into the city's broader affordable housing plans? Because I, I do think they're connected and I, I'm not, I understand coordination with departments is complicated and takes time, but it, it just, I, I don't know how we can look at this completely in isolation without looking at how it affects this other conversation the entire council is having around housing. Yes, that sounds good. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thanks. Yeah, my my question really relates maybe to the scope of the public engagement we're we're doing. Like, I just want to recognize, right? Like in the the memo, it outlines that some of this question around stakeholder and neighborhood engagement in this kind of provision has been has been was done relatively recently. And so, to me, as somebody who's been a part of community engagement processes, I would hope that it's like, here's what we heard from you all. Is this correct? This is what council is doing. And for that to happen, kind of more as we've been using the word expeditiously like <laughs> expeditiously and not and not like starting over from scratch because i think we've heard really loud and clear that people want these things sooner rather than later and i understand all of us want to be really intentional but i i don't think like continuing to push and push and push on this because it's complicated is the right way either so just wanted to understand maybe a little bit more of the scope of community engagement given that this has already occurred to some extent um is envisioned I, I I was thinking that we would take the feedback that we've gotten from you and use the starting point, maybe make some tweaks to the starting point that we brought to you tonight, um, and then get gather feedback based on that from the community. So we would set up the Lakewood Together site, and that would be the way that we listen to what people have. Of course, we'll do outreach to make sure people know that it's available for them to go and provide us feedback through that site. That's what I have in mind. So we're not starting all over again. Okay, so with that in mind, is there anyone that um, does not agree with moving forward in that way? I'm sorry, Councilor Nystrom, you've got your hands up. No, I, I just wanted to ask for an opportunity to review like what's what's documented as an output of this meeting um, and then will be submitted for public input. Um, you know, as, as a, yeah, I can't think either just collating that this feedback before before it's 
you know, uh, given the blessing to move forward and saying this is what we're going to do, right? But um, other than that, no, I don't have any objection to what you were just asking. <laughs> okay. Do we have any objections? Okay. That looks like consensus to me. Do you, Director Luland, have the direction that you need from us, or are there any other questions that you've got? No, I don't have any other questions right now. Thank you so much for all the feedback. Okay. Okay. Thank you for all of the work that all of you have done. I mean, looking at all the faces here that were involved with our responses tonight, it's, you know, I really appreciate, and again, I appreciate com you know, community resources department reaching out to people that are genuine experts in this space to really make sure that as we're looking through this, that we're doing it the right way. So um, I appreciate all of the time that all of you guys have put into um, the work leading up to today, but the fact that you're still with us at 10.36 p.m. So thank you. Thank you. All right, and then with that, um, we'll just hand it over. Do I have any counselors that have committee reports this evening? Counselor Stewart and Counselor Mayor Guerrero. Just a very quick one, um, reminding the public that the Budget and Audit Board would like to hear from you. We have a survey, a community survey that is open through April 25th. So you've got 10 days and all of the information as well as the survey can be found at lakewood.org backslash Lakewood Funding. Thank you. Councilor Mayor Guerrero. Yes, um, the uh, next HPC meeting is on April 25th. Um, the agenda is currently like, it, it might have already, actually I didn't double check liquid speeds, but it's either posted or like about to be, like it's been in the process for 10 days. Um, so it's close. I forget which day like staff does that. So people can look at that and check it out. What I really want to like draw council's attention to and the public's attention to, because I think this is sort of the earnest beginning of getting, a, having a lot of conversations about actual policy, which is very exciting, um, which is basically what we got to last time is um, a highlights of what we think are the priorities, like our recommendations. Um, and we haven't finalized that. It was not a vote. We like essentially did a ton of brainstorming. There are now notes. And so that list of recommendations will be a part of the like packet that's available on Lakewood Speaks ahead of that meeting. You can give comments on Lakewood Speaks. And then we our, our hope is that we're able to then like show up with like we've up down voted on or at least have some level of consensus on sort of here's what we as the HPC who've gotten a lot more time than all of council will get to have on the strategic housing plan to chew on it. Uh, here's what we think are things that are, here's what we've heard from staff are sort of already moving. So it's like stuff we need to do a little tweak or a low hanging fruit or whatever. And it's like, let's make that happen or support staff and what they need or whatever. And then here's the handful of bigger, juicier, like more community outreach, more necessary like building of of complex systems of principles, like related to how the green space would like hit maybe the way that like Mark and what, right, that, those types of conversations um, and how we think we should be prioritizing the HPC's time to be getting that feedback, getting that expertise, working with staff on like how to then, to then shape those. So that's, we're sort of finishing that discussion at our next HPC meeting. And Mayor Strong, I know we've talked about this. So if I'm, if I'm misillustrating it in some way, please feel free to correct me, but the long and the short is that we're going to have that continued discussion from last month where we have more input from our city like staff experts and we have more information about what is moving or not on these things that we said we have a special priority interest in and we'll be able to essentially have a, a dig in a little bit further and then um have um a level of, of hpc based uh uh consensus in a, in a recommendation of, of how to focus some of our housing energy, which is obviously a huge priority, and not all of that's going to be on the HPC. So we're hoping to also recommend, like, here are things that we don't think need that level of scrutiny, time, commitment, et cetera, that is necessary to bring to a commission. So that's what we're looking at. Perfect. Thank you. Councilor Cruz and Councilor Sinks. 
just wanted to briefly note that for the legislative committee, um, we likely we will be having what is likely our last meeting of the legislative session on um, April 25th at 8 a.m. So we're not meeting this week, we're meeting next week and looking forward to seeing my wonderful members then. The Head Start Committee meets tomorrow and we will look at the federal review report. We'll look at the school calendar. And for those listening, they do have job postings, two full-time jobs and four part-time jobs. That's it. All right, thank you everybody. And with that, um, seeing no further business this evening, I will go ahead and adjourn the study session at 1041 p.m. Everybody have a good night.